guards, dignitaries on the podium, esteemed guests, faculties, scholars, and students, a very good morning to all of you. On behalf of the organizing committee, jointly led by the Department of Zoology, Ashutosh College, and Ramakrishna Mission Vidyamandira Belu, of remote sensing, geographic information system, RSGIS, and artificial intelligence, AI, in expanding research frontiers in biological sciences. I extend a warm welcome to each of you to the esteemed premises of Ramakrishna Mission Vidyamandira's Vivekananda Shabagriho. To commence our seminar, we will be graced with a traditional Vedic chanting performed by the students in the Department of Microbiology and Zoology, Ramakrishna Mission Vidya Mandir. Dhrubhajyoti Ganguli, Shagni Kroy, Snehumoy Dash, Shubhadeep Bhaskar, Bibhash Sharkar, Shumodip Shahu, and Shubham Layak. I extend warmest welcome to them as they take the stage. Om Sri Guru Bhyo Namaha Hari Om Sahana Bhavatu Sahano Bhulaktu Sahaviryam Karvavahai Tejasmi Navadi Tamastuma Vidvishapahai Om Shanti 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 Om Shamno Mitra Shambhalu Naha Shamno Bhavatar Yama Shamno Indra Brihaspati Shamno Vishnu Rurukramaha Namo Brahmane Namaste Vayo Tvameva Pratyakshan Brahmashe Tvameva Pratyakshan Brahma Vadishyami Rutaṁ Vadishyami Satyaṁ Vadishyami Tanmāṁ Avatū Tad Vaktāraṁ Avatū Avatū Māṁ Avatū Vaktāraṁ Om Shanti 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 Om Bhadraṁ Karne Vishrinyāma Devāha Bhadraṁ Pashya Maksha Virya Yatraha Srirai Rangai Sushu Bhagam Sastanu Vihi Vyashe Ma Deva Hitaya Dayu Swasti Na Indra Vridha Shabaha Swasti Na Pusha Vishwa Vedaha Swasti Na Staksha Varishta Nemihi Swasti No Bruhas Patir Dadhatu Om Shanti 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 Om Madhubhata Ritayate Madhuksharanti Shindhavaha Madhirna Shanto Shadhi Madhunakta Muto Shasi Madhumat Parthi Bang Rajaha Madhu Dhyaurastva Napita Madhu Manya Vanaspatir Madhu Magam Asta Suryaha Madhir Garva Bhavantu Naha Om Shanti 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 Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate 
शांति 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 हरे ओम तत्सत श्री राम कृष्णापण नमस्तु Thank you for the serene and spiritually uplifting rendition. Now let us proceed to the inaugural welcome address which will be delivered by Swami Mahapragyananda, the respected principal Maharaj of Ramakrishna Mission Vidya Mandira. I kindly request Maharaj to share his words of welcome with us. Maharaj, please. <coughs> ओम नमो भगवते श्री राम कृष्णा गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीबडी एंड ऑल आर वेलकम टू दिस प्रेमिस ऑफ राम कृष्ण मिशन विद्या मंदिर बेलूर मॉट दिस प्लेस एक्चुअली बिफोर दिस फॉर्मल एड्रेस i especially those who have come here for the first time for their information i would like to share that this very institution this very name was coined by swami vivekananda the epoch making educationist and thinker and he actually dreamt of he conceived the idea of one institution in his physical lifetime which will impart real education both secular technical scientific and spiritual to the aspirants especially particularly of this country and abroad and not only in belur mot but across the across this country and the world at large and after his passing after a few decades many academic institution of ram krishna mission started working and where you we all are here we all gathered this is a very dream place where swami vivekananda lived and he took the initiative to idealize his own concept of education so today we are here it's a joint it's a collaborative effort it's a, under the mau activity between ashutosh college kolkata and ramkrishna mission vidyamandir belur mot one day national level satellite symposium and it is needless to mention that the topic is need of the hour contribution of remote sensing geographic information system and artificial intelligence on the opening new research field of biological sciences so at the outset i would like to offer my humble pranams to many of my acharyas especially for the students i am telling i am very much i am very honored to have on the dais and in audience many of my acharyas my teachers who actually just like you when i was a student who played a very pivotal role as they are doing with you today so i have on the dais having professor dr shubhit chandra dashgupta professor sumitham choudhury the audience dr sumona saha sri porna madam so many are there so i welcome all of them especially and on the dais present today's speakers of three sessions dr dibendu datto who is a former general manager and group director in rsc isro he will speak on application of geoinformatics in biological research in recent advances advancements i welcome dr datto on the dais present the 
Speaker of another session, Dr. Orijit Bhattacharya, who is the Associate Professor, Department of Biological Sciences, School of Life Sciences and Biotechnology, Adamas University. And of course, I welcome Dr. Orijit Bhattacharya. And I also welcome, I, I extend my cordial welcome to Dr. Bhim Dutt Joshi, who is a scientist, Sea Wildlife Section, Zoological Survey of India. And in advance, uh, I welcome again uh, his very near and dear to me. I, I, I think whether Manush Babu here, Manush Babu has not reached, he will reach soon. Uh, Professor Dr. Manush Kobi, who is the principal of Ashutosh College, and my dear students, and especially I welcome also the faculty members and scientists uh, from different institutes, colleges and universities. And of course, uh, in this gathering, I'm very honored to say I welcome also one of the distinguished alumni of Bidda Mundir, Dr. Pratap Kumar Dash, who was a very well-known scientist of protein chemistry in Indian Institute of Chemical Biology. He's one of the alumnus and present the faculty members of departments of zoology and microbiology of this department and very warm welcome to the students uh, undergraduate postgraduate students from different colleges universities and research scholars also um, you know very often we organize our college this campus we organize such programs apart from our regular day-to-day -day teaching learning. This is very much encouraging. This is very enlightening, you know, mind-blowing also. And I'm very happy and uh, I would like to say uh, many posters actually. This poster presentation we always encouraged and this collaborative endeavor too we encouraged, we expected, we welcome and we are very happy that many of you did respond to it. So we have many posters. Soon it will be displayed, poster sessions. And, you know, uh, at the end, I would like to wrap up with these words that this is for my students especially. This is very good to attend seminars, workshop, presenting, you know, uh, this uh, posters, anything. This is very good. But I would always say, whenever you are studying undergraduate or postgraduate, apart from your regular daily study routine, you must fix a goal, especially for the B BSc student, I am telling, what you want to be after completion of whatever BSc in zoology, microbiology, botany, computer science. This is very important, especially in this undergraduate level, to determine in this phase what you, how you want to see yourself in life and accordingly start doing. It is not, it is good that you are studying sincerely but fix a goal and side by side, if you, if you are determined to become a researcher, this is very good. If you want to go for some other job after completion your graduation or post-graduation, that is very important and do it accordingly. And you know, you all are sincere and try to be much more and try to give your level best to your academic pursuit and to become or to fulfill your dream in life. That is very important. With this, I welcome once again all in the seminar. I pray to Almighty, to Holy Trio for the very successful completion of this program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maharaj, for your inspiring words. Moving forward, we have the pleasure of felicitating our esteemed delegates on the dais with books on the Holy Trio, published here at Ramakrishna Mission Vidyamandira Belurmot. 
And once again, I invite our Principal Maharaj to bestow this honor upon our distinguished guests. Ladies and gentlemen, we felicitate our speakers. Dr. Dibbendu Dottu, former General Manager and Group Director, NRSC, ISRO Government of India. Thank you, sir. Dr. Urijit Bhattacharya, Associate Professor, Department of Biological Sciences, School of Life Science and Biotechnology, Adamas University. Thank you, sir. Our next speaker, Dr. Bhim Dath Joshi, Scientist C, Wildlife Section, Zoological Survey of India. Thank you, sir. We have our distinguished chairpersons for today's seminar. We have our very beloved sir, Dr. Shumit Hom Choudhury, Professor, Department of Zoology, University of Calcutta. Thank you, sir. And last but not the least, our very own Dr. Shubit Chandra Dash Gupto, former professor, Department of Zoology, Maul and Azad College, and presently Emeritus Honorary Professor at Ramakrishna Mission Vidya Mandira. Thank you, sir. Come to end of session one. Please bear with us for a few minutes as we make the transition to the next session. Thank you. Transition to our next session. Both this and the following scientific session will be chaired by our esteemed Emeritus Professor from the Department of Zoology, Ramakrishna Mission with Damandira Belurmot, Dr. Shubir Chandra Dasgupta. A very brief introduction about Dr. Dasgupta. Dr. Dasgupta, with his extensive expertise in the field of toxicology, pharmacology, and screening of bioactive compounds, brings a wealth of knowledge to our seminar. With over 21 years of postgraduate teaching and 32 years of undergraduate teaching experiences, along with guiding 11 research scholars for their PhD degrees and holding two patents, one national and one international, for his research contributions, his contributions to these fields are invaluable. With this very brief introduction, I extend a warm welcome to Dr. Das Gupta to assume the role of the chairperson and kindly introduce our first speaker. So please. Very good morning to all of you. It's really a great pleasure for me to be here. And after my retirement in September 2023, I deeply associated with this premier institution and uh, it's a great honor for me to introduce our first speaker, Professor Dr. Dibbendu Dottu. So before introductions, I must thank the Department of Zoology Ashutosh College and the Department of Zoology Ramakrishna Mission Vidya Mandira for this joint venture. And obviously the area of this today's discussions is absolutely new to all of us. As you know that artificial intelligence has gripped our daily life in daily needs, especially in the biological sciences. So after the extensive brainstorming session throughout the day, I think all of us has enriched myself for this artificial intelligence and the application of GIS in our modern biological sciences. So, Professor Dr. Dibbendu Dotto, who is a formal general manager and the group director in our SC ISRO Government of India. And his lecture title is Application of Geoinformatics in Biological Research and Recent Advancement. Dibbendu Dotto received the PhD degree in agricultural physics from Indian Agricultural Research Institute, New Delhi. India in 1992. He has been a senior scientist and a general manager with the Regional Remote Sensing Center India Space Research Organization, Kolkata, India, since 2013. He has been working with ISRO since 1992. He has co-authored more than 45 peer-reviewed journal and symposium articles. 40 scientific reports and contributed to one book chapter, guided three PhD and 45 postgraduate students. 
His research inter interest include foliar nutrient quality mapping of crops using hyperspectral data and surface energy balance using satellite data. So this is a new domain of the life science area. With this few words, I request Professor Dotto to deliver his lecture. Please. Maharaji, Honorable Maharaji, Principal Asantosh College, the distinguished faculties of Asutos College and Ramakrishna Mission Vidya Mandir. It's a great opportunity for me to stand in the presence of you on this day because it is just after 44 years I started my career in one of the adjoining campus 44 years back and today I, again I am here. It's a great opportunity to come to this knowledge institution as well as I say, it's a temple of wisdom, basically, to my understanding. And in front of me, I see the future India, the ignited minds. Well, I, of course, initially I was hesitant that, you know, that my field is not the geological science, but how to address on that. But, uh, of course, I could see there is an ample opportunity while I go through that the studies that have been carried out. and. Uh, Thought initially, just to give you an idea about the geoinformatics, maybe many of you are aware of that, but looking at the diverse profile, I thought that just to tell you about the, what is geoinformatics altogether, and then later on that what has been done using this geoinformatics in the field of zoological science, or rather more of like a wildlife habitat management, and at the end I will come with a typical example, what we carried out for the country of Canada as well as for the entire Central Asia, which is a very intelligent, for about an intelligent insect, you might not be knowing sitting in the eastern part of the country. But if you go to the western part of the country like Rajasthan, Haryana and Delhi, it is the biggest disaster in fact worldwide. So I will be discussing on that in detail, that how we develop a special recent support system using the geospatial technologies. Of course, the work was carried out a couple of years back. Maybe the technological advancements and uh, along with that thing, perhaps some of the, you know, like the add-on modules are being changed, some new technologies are being incorporated and it is, this refinement is going on continuously. Um, so, uh, so geoinformatics in short, if I say it is basically the science and technology which develops and uses the information science and the infrastructure to address the problems of geography, geosciences and related branches of engineering. It deals with the acquisition, storage, processing, production and the presentation and at the end the dissemination of the information. So broadly three different disciplines are involved here. To name the first one is the remote sensing. When I talk remote sensing, it could be either in the satellite altitude, it can be aerial remote sensing, it can be ground-based, anything. The second important component is to generate a huge amount of data. Like these days, you know that every day, if I talk about the Indian satellites only, it's a picabytes, terabytes of data we are generating every day, downloading in the ground station at Sadnagar, Hyderabad. But what to do with the data? That huge amount of data processing, the data intelligence is required, the data analytics is required, big data analysis is required. So it is actually say it is a twin technology that remote sensing data acquisition and the data management. And the third important thing is coming which in day to day life you are using perhaps not knowing what is happening in detail in the backdrop is the location based services. Many of you perhaps when you came from home to this place. You are looking for a taxi, Ola and Uber and you are definitely you get the app and then you look for the taxi when you, uh, what you want to get at your doorstep and you can see in a few minutes a vehicle arrives. So in the backdrop this huge networking is going on. The technology is involved in this thing, lot of decision making, logic, rules are going. This is basically a location based services. So these three things, although there are a large number of other 
disciplines are there. I am not going into detail because these three are mostly being utilized. And the <coughs> right hand side, bottom, you can see that we have given the different platforms, right? So the platforms can be uh, like either from the space. Now, space also platform could be at different altitudes. We call it normally low earth altitude, then medium earth orbit, and the geo, that is geostationary orbit. And the altitude varies from at the lowest orbit, it may be sometimes uh, somewhere between 500 to 600 kilometer. Then medium earth uh, uh, orbit, that may be somewhere 25,000. And the geostationary that is, is more than 35,000 kilometers. So these are the different altitudes where from you can look at the globe, what is happening either 24-7 or maybe at a particular time interval. Uh, before I go, it is many of you know, but still, as I said, that looking at the diversity of the group, perhaps, what is remote sensing? In a very crude sense, it is basically acquisition of data or the information of about any object without having a physical touch. Giving a small example, like all of you are using your sensor, you are doing remote sensing, you are looking at me, but not physically touching because your eye is getting the reflected signal from my body and you can recognize that a person is speaking. So you have five sensors. God has given us five sensors. Mostly we make use of the two sensors. So that's remote sensing is that data acquisition mechanism. It can be from any platform, even a human being also a remote sensing sensor. The geographic information system, the huge amount of data you collect, the varieties of data you collect from the different sources, how to integrate that. You get some data in the form of tabular data. You get some data in the form of some tone maps. You get some structured data, some geospatial data, location-based services data. Who will integrate all the data sets? And bring out a meaningful information, that is what we call, it is not the data, but the knowledge to bring out from the data. So this is basically the GIS helps you to, to uh, do that kind of analysis. And the third one is the satellite navigation. Let me tell you at this point, most of us, we know satellite navigation as GPS. Actually, GPS is not the name. It is basically the American constellation, but it is so much embedded in our day-to-day -day life that we have forgotten that it is a satellite-based navigation system. We always call it as a GPS. You must be knowing few days back, India also had the second generation that is your navigation satellite. We call it IRNS 1A, 1B, 1C, and so forth. And our Honorable Prime Minister has given the name of the Navic system. So we are under Navic constellation. And maybe in, within, I think, one or two months, your all smartphones will have a receiver for this Navic system. You will get a much accurate signal, right, what you are getting today. So these three things, basically, if we consolidate, then the geoinformatics part, we can clarify much better way. Left hand side panel, you can see the different sources. If I just mention a few, you can see that in the left top, this is basically the Munter spectral image, which is most commonly, you can say 95% of the users are using this data because the processing is here, data volume is low. We have one of the latest sensor, what we call is that hyperspectral remote sensing, which is of my main interest also. It is basically a data cube. We are acquiring the data of an object in more than 200 number of bands. Whereas in case of multispectral, the band number is limited to five at the most seven. So the, you know, like it is just like the sensors. If we close our eyes and with the rest of the sensors, we try to understand by he hearing the sound or by the smell, the amount of information get and you open your eyes, you get much more information, right? So it is the same way, like hyperspectral is basically the fingerprint of every object. We have some radar, like a radar can be passive or it can be the active radar. We have that thermal data, which is very important, especially in the global warming condition or scenario. It is basically telling you the, how the global you know, climate or the temperature is changing, the temperature regime. Where the high latitudes are getting more warmer, so this all information, who will give you? Ground-based temperature sensors will not work because you don't get the spatial variability with that. Scalability, absolutely not possible. Then we have some leader. Leader can be atmospheric leader, ground leader also. Then we can have some uh, passive microbe, especially uh, it is very helpful when the cyclone is being formed. 
And what is the temperature of the cloud? Because lower the temperature, the intensity of rainfall will be higher. This is a thumb rule I'm talking about, not that simple, of course. Then you have a uh, like satellite altimetry, like you must be knowing that uh, there are many, many reports that the you know, ocean surface is increasing this much, this much millimeter in every 10 years. Who is doing, who is measuring that? It is satellite altimetry. What is basically measuring the global surface roughness as well as what is the sea surface rise. You have some leader, especially, uh, sorry, there's a limb uh, spectrometer or the limb sounder, we can say, like the, you know that South Pole, there is a uh, ozone hole. Of course, now it is almost vanished. It is almost failed. So this kind of information. Then we have a very interesting kind of uh, remote sensing, what we call the gravity anomaly measurement. Few days back it came that how the North India, that is Indo-Gangetic plane was almost, it is in the dark zone in terms of groundwater. You know, it is basically the gravity uh, anomaly that is being measured by two consecutive satellites. It's very interesting, two satellites following each other. When there were the gravity, you know, changes in the gravity, there will be changes in the altitude. And the changes in the altitude, the other satellite which is following it, it is measuring and that the changes in the altitude is being converted. It's not that easy, but through some modeling activities, converted into that, what is the depletion of the groundwater. That is basically the gravity information it is giving. Then of course we have the scatterometer, especially it is very good for the wind, surface wind. And uh, we have a, of course photometry, it is basically very important when you are doing some research of the extraplanetary, you know, like this kind of particle movements, some particles are coming from other, you know, planets or not, that type, it is very useful. So the same thing has been explained in the right hand side. But the leader use is very, very restricted out of all these things. Most of the use is towards the visual and the multispectral. These are the two uses you can see. And if you look at the entire electromagnetic spectrum, you can see that human eye is sensitive only to this region, only this much. Whereas the remote sensing center, sensors, they are responsive up to the millimeter wave, even it can go up to the radio wave level. So that means you get a broad spectrum of information which is apparently not possible through the optical sensor. Uh, now, this is a very brief about the satellite remote sensing, the different kind of sensors, because I have to touch upon, then I'll go to that low-cost study. Now the GIS, basically what GIS, I said in the beginning, that is a data management system, data retrieval and the modeling aspects. So here there are two different way of data how you represent it. The special data I'm talking, not a simple tabular data, right? So here you can see that uh, left hand side panel you see this is called vector data. Vector means you are all used to, right? From your childhood days you are drawing, you know, with a line, polygon, points, line. So this is a vector data. Whereas all the satellites, they acquire data and they store data in the form of raster, means if you go to your telephone, like in a, you have taken a photograph, keep on zooming, keep on zooming. At a point of time, you will see that all these small, small blocks are appearing. So these small blocks are nothing but what you always characterize the resolution power of your smartphone is in terms of megapixel. So that means pixel, the unit of dust is pixel or grid or lattice, anything you talk about. So this is the way how it is represented, the line this way, polygon this way, and also the points this way. So this is the one of the major difference with the vector and the raster, right? The advantage of raster is that any kind of mathematical operations, logical operations, big data analytics you do, it is much faster in the raster mode. But as vector mode, it is very complicated and difficult. You cannot do in some cases. Uh, this is just I gave you that if the raster size or the cell size increases, how the accuracy gets diluted. Like in your telephone, uh, like in your smartphone, 10 years back you had a resolution, suppose 10 megapixel, you used to say, wow, that's great. But nowadays you are getting, suppose, more than 50 megapixels. What does it mean? There's a difference in terms of qualities, very fine. So uh, basically the advantage of GIS is like uh, you have the ability or to integrate the different layers coming from different sources because they are all georeferenced, geographically referenced. You can integrate those data sets and bring out some useful information what you are looking for. I said one small example. 
Suppose I want in a particular location there is no primary school. I want a primary school to be located. Criteria has been given by me, the government has given the criteria, this much should be the population, child population or you can say adult population. The road, it should be near uh, to a road, maybe 500 meter away from the road, there should have a tube oil, there should have electricity. So what happens, like all the layers, geographic layers, if you integrate and fire a query onto that integrator data sets, they show me the optimum site, so there is an electricity, there is a water supply, which is within the 500 meter of the main road, immediately GIS will give you that, these are the probable sites. So decision making becomes very faster, what we call a visual decision making. Now it is the concept has changes, everyone says visually show me. You want to have a tube oil here, you want to have a post office here, you visually show me. What is the neighborhood? So who does this job? The GIS can do this job. And uh, if, if I summarize all the activities, but it captures the data, stores the data, you have the advantage of querying, that is what if. It's very popular terminology in GIS, what if? What if? What will happen if this thing happens? The result immediately it will give. Then you have analysis and then finally this is the display with the decision alternatives. Uh, so, so, so uh, real world what you do, you try to model the data in terms of spatial objects and uh, in terms of vector raster which I have already told. Coming to the third component of the geoinformatics, I am quickly uh, passing through this thing because just to give an idea, uh, this is basically a GPS receiver. Please understand that a navigation system has three different segments. You have a space segment, you have a control segment, you have a user segment. What you are all using is a user segment. You have only receiver, you can't send a message to the satellite, right? So the space segment constituted of a collection of satellite, you can say the large number of satellite collections, maybe 24 or maybe seven in case of India, it is a regional navigation system, right? They give actually the uh, timing, dynamics, and the location precisely. Even your phone is capable of receiving that message. Uh, and uh, this is a kind of receiver. Uh, there are satellite constellations which are nicely positioned so that you get a three-dimensional networking and you can come out, you know that three variables, unknown variables, latitude, longitude, altitude. How many equations you need? You need four equations. So you can get it and you can solve that particular problem which you are looking for. And based on that thing these days, you must be seeing there's a lot of apps has appeared, especially during the COVID time. Have you seen that COVID time, COVID? COVID, everyone had in their telephone call, you know, telephone, you have that particular app. It gives you an idea that in your neighborhood, how many people are affected with the COVID, what is the situation, what is the severity? A huge effort was taken, that is the location based services, and many cases you will see that um, containment zone, they also decided based on these things. So we understood the utility of this location based mapping, but unfortunately after COVID, everything is in the cold storage. And no one knows what happened to that data, it's a huge data sets can be taken up for the research. What is the migration behavior of the disease? Unfortunately, that is in the cold storage. So in ISRO, as I come from ISRO, we have developed about 56 number of apps for different ministries. The advantage of the app is that it is time, date, location stamped, not like that by sitting at home you cannot say, yes sir, everything running fine in the field, there is no problem, you don't think anything. You have to go to the field, right? You have to capture the location to take a photograph, the name who is taking all this informations. So that's why it has become a very good proof for the government officials or anyone who are in the field that really they visited the area or by sitting at home they are doing the work. So the large number of the apps are available these days for watershed development, forestry, even the Prime Minister Fasal Vima Jojana, like all crop insurance you might be knowing it is there, Panchati Raj institutions, all these things. Even few days back I saw in the newspaper in Calcutta it has come. Like if any road is really, it has a pothole near your home or some, somewhere, you get down from your vehicle, take the photo and small app, I forgot the name of the app, 
just upload that information and within 30 days it will be repaired, something like this. This is the real utility of navigation based services. Uh, now, directly having a small background on the geoinformatics, I'm rightly coming to the applications. As my topic is only biology, I will not go into much of what are or cryogenics or any, uh, sorry, cryo. I will not go to that area. I will only touch upon the agriculture mostly and then I will directly come to forestry followed by that special reason support system. So here I did not read the name. You can see almost no field is left out who are using randomly and you can see operationally the remote sensing and GIS technology. You can read out anyone. I think any your discipline also will appear here. Like geology to water resources to agriculture to forestry, name anything. So all these things are nowadays, even the crop insurance which has recently been emerged, all based on satellite remote sensing. Coming to this ocean studies also, yes, large number of applications, the sea surface temperature, you will say what is the relevance of sea surface temperature? Any cyclonic formation, it starts from the sea surface temperature anomaly. So it is very good indicator for not only for this disaster alarming or disaster warning, but it is also very good for the, you know, like aquatic flora, aquatic fauna, how they will develop and grow. You have the uh, ocean chlorophyll, which is very important to those who know that the pisciculture, especially for the fisheries mapping zone, this is being used as an input. Then in the glacier, the slow albedo, because why the global temperature is increasing, one of the reason is that the global albedo is decreasing, means it is absorbing more number of, more amount of heat energy or the incoming solar energy. More the ice cap is melt, means what will happen? The reflectivity will go less. So temperature will be more, temperature will get accumulated. So like snow melt regular, like in the, uh, in the uh, hydroelectric power projects, how much water will be appearing at that particular site, that is also monitored. Not only that quantified, that how much water on daily basis it will appear, that is also being done based on the satellite imagery. Atmospheric studies, a large number of studies, you can say all the ambient condition of the atmosphere as well as the convective activities and also the, uh, the potential heat energy, how much potential is the heat is available. This all analysis also being done through satellite data only. Now coming very interesting, uh, uh, profile, this profile what you are seeing in the left hand side, it is basically the spectral profile of green vegetation. This is a gram, gram is like a Bengal gram, that. So most of the vegetation profile are like this. Why I am showing? There is a reason. If you look at the remote sensing, perhaps 95% use is for agriculture and vegetation studies. Now, here you can see some bars, that is blue bar, here is a green bar, what represents the broadband satellites. I have two kinds of satellite data, one is a multispectral, the broadband, another is a fine resolution which makes really the profile. This blue band means one of the multispectral satellites, very popular, not only uh, abroad in India also, that is Landsat ETM+. Plus. So, if you want to represent this curve with these blue bars, it will be very coarse. Perhaps you will miss very of the subtle absorption features which are very critical for the vegetation. Whereas, in case of hyperspectral, you get the complete profile, as I said in the beginning, just like a fingerprint. Now, within this area again, within this area, the entire game is here within this area, in a green vegetation. What is that game? Here this is the red region you all might be knowing that vegetation prefers red light to absorb for the photosynthesis. And there is a reflectance in the green region. It is very common that vegetation is looking green because the green light is reflected to the maximum extent. And this is the region which is sharp increase in the reflectance we call it the inflection region. That means the slope is very high. So three critical areas one is that maximum green reflectance, then minimum green reflectance or absorptance, maximum absorptance, and there is a sudden abrupt increase in the vegetation reflectance. Now, this particular area, 
is mostly governed or controlled by the biochemistry. This bi optical properties are controlled by biochemistry means the pigments, leaf water content, it can be protein, it can be nitrogen. Whereas this particular area is controlled by the leaf physical properties that means like a spongy parenchyma it can be or it is basically the intercellular space. Having said this, that means if you disintegrated this curve, you get one way the chemical information, the biochemistry related information and if you go to the right side, you get the plant physical information means what is the intercellular space means the plant is more healthy, that means what will happen? This will go more up. If there is a stress, this particular wanted nanometer. But here what you are seeing, it is up to 900 because the entire game, the entire mystery is lying within this zone. Uh, using this multispectral data, like uh, it, is, it is operational especially for the many of the ministry projects that you might be knowing that nowadays that you have to give a crop forecasting for the major kharif crop, rabi crop and the, some of the summer crops, right? Uh, you will say, what is the forecasting? Why forecasting is required? Because government has to decide its exim policies that how much grain it will import. If you want surplus in terms of grain production, you need not. Rather, you will think that time where it can be exported and what should be the, uh, no, the prices you have to fix. So, you can easily count or easily map this red color area. Red means in satellite imagery, we call it a false color composite. That's why green is always red. So all red means it is a crop area, very clearly visible. And you can, through digital image processing, maybe by one minute you can calculate that how much area means how many pixels are red, what is the total area. So you can get that how much area is under this crop or that crop. So it is operational now uh, project from the government of India. And not only that, you can also monitor what is the health conditions. Like I am showing you uh, India because ISRO does it on a regular basis, every 15 days interval it does, what is the crop conditions. Again it is based on some index, what we call the normalized different vegetation index. And the different colors basically representing this curve. As I said that if there is a stress, the curve that means in the infrared region it will go down, red will go up and the green will come down. So it is a basically game, just like you know, like uh, what you say plastic shit. You know, one will go up, one will go down and all this entire game. Through that you can also map the, the, the what we call, uh, the health conditions of the standing crops. Now, uh, along with that you can also have a crop classification also you can do based on the spectral reflectance pattern, based on the temporal profile. When I say temporal profile, I will come here, it will be much good uh, for understanding. See, these are basically the Basically the time series satellite data products means these are the vegetation indices. Vegetation indices time series. Every fortnight I have data, every week I have data, I cannot give it will be full. So I have given selectively just to give you an idea that how the vegetation greenness is changing with the time. This is the first fortnight of January to so I have given almost last, almost last fortnight of December. So you can see that how this area I am pointing out in this area particularly because it is a DBZ canal command and the Kangshabuti area. A lot of potato cultivation. So, so, so the vegetation health is very good. The potato are harvested when it is, so you don't see this thing. <coughs> Sorry. And again you can see it is the bodo rice which is taking the growth. So you can have for every point, every point what is that you know the profile the cropping intensity, the health information, the type of crop for every point or every pixel you are getting. One small example, suppose if I click on a single point, uh, uh, okay, I uh, will come to the next, it is there. Yes, a point you click and then you get this kind of temporal spectral profile. What does it speak, this particular graph? See, there are three peaks, greenness peaks means that there are three major crops are growing in that area. That means triple crop area. The cropping intensity also you can calculate. As well as in which particular season, September means it is Karib season, all of you know. May means it is the, you know, like the borrow or in the summer season. And it is in the 
ravi season the different kind of crops they are cropping intensity for every point you can do if you have a time series data we are also operationally working for the disease forecasting see what happens when the disease happens nothing can be done except go for prophylactic spraying and you know the effect the you know negative effect of the spraying and all these things whereas the remote sensing technology at least one week to 10 days before you can forecast that okay the something is going to happen wrong how you do because if the temporal profile you take it we suddenly see that where disease has occurred in the early stage itself the curve or the index curve is going drooping down that means something has happened wrong in that particular pixel what is that that we have to go to the field and we check it so this entire quantitative growing area again it is in the dvc canal command we have mapped also precisely that we map every year we do that job that entire potato growing area how much area is the potato leaf blight affected right <coughs> then another study agriculture we do that is the uh, like drought study regular earlier days you know it is a very nice joke i was in rajasthan uh, just to break the monotony what happened you know that there is a meteorological drought there is a hydrological drought there is an agricultural drought droughts are there uh but in rajasthan there are 12 districts are drought prone they said no 16 districts are drought there is a lot of debate going on that time chief minister was there also gela to you are also sitting in front then what is the reason remote sensing says 12 state department says 16 very nicely at a point of time the chief minister cut a joke sir this is another type of drought what is that is a political drought sir because if you declare as a political drought you will get more funding how nicely he uh, said so anyway uh, that is a very lighter side <clears throat> so the drought analysis and regular drought forecasting also being done on operational basis this is another study which was done basically uh, don't think this is a single study stand alone we keep on doing you might be knowing at the time of ya cyclone there is a huge inundation happened in the east midnapur as well as the north districts of odisha that time only radar data is very effective to give you the uh, water inundated areas the dark black areas are basically the water stagnated areas so immediately overnight used to get the data used to process and used to see that how much cropped area is under water how much has been damaged again on a single day observation you cannot say that it is damaged or it will recover again so we we normally do the you know like 15 days data analysis and when you see that there is no vegetation has come up again we say it is it is completely damaged so this kind of study is a very regular study third study in agriculture science the irrigation use efficiency right hand side you can see that this is one uh, basically the uh, sugar can uh, not sugar can it is basically the wheat grown area and wheat grown area after irrigation the thermal imaging is giving you the idea that where there is shortfall in the water and where there is excess of water simple thing the red color means the areas where the temperature of the leaf canopy is high that means it has not received adequate water and dark blue means it has received excess water that's why the surface is cooler so this kind of mapping and the irrigation use efficiency also you can map there are various indices through which we can also compute so i am not going into detail little lack of time the next use is that forest fire which is also a, i think it is also of your interest especially the zoology community because lot of fauna also gets damage due to this kind of forest fire now forest fire can be done through the thermal data also as optical data it's a regular product you get on the web it's freely available for the citizens so here just uh, see these are all satellite data either it is picking up the image that how the smoke or the plume is moving forward or you can get through the thermal data also thermal data also you can make out the areas which are fire uh, which has fire is a very high in terms of surface temperature <clears throat> so the control measure is basically taken in three different stages one is a pre fire that is basically early warning the risk zoning which are the areas few days back i was working for bhutan right now i am working for the government of bhutan also Uh, it's very interesting that one particular area I will show you in the image in the Bhutan. It is highly fire prone. I was trying to look at what is the reason. That area is dominated by chir pine forest. Chir pine forest has got very high level of waxy substances. 
so it makes the inflammation much easier uh, so these are kind of things you have to look into you have to you know like spade out that what is the reason for this kind of things <clears throat> Now for the thermal data, what we make use of two bands we make use whenever there is a forest fire. One is a near 10 micrometer band and another is a 4 micrometer bands. And this particular graph gives the reason that why we make use of these two bands. Uh, this is a common thing like you might be knowing Stephen Boltzmann uh, law you might be knowing that when there is a high temperature the maximum emissivity goes towards the shorter wavelength and when the temperature is low, then the maximum emissivity goes towards the longer wavelength. So here what happens that these two temperatures basically represent two different peaks. One is for the fire pixels where the temperature is very high, emission peak is to a shorter wavelength and we go for the normal area where there is no, no fire. So in that case what happens, the emitting power is maximum at the longer wavelength. So these two anomaly, these two analogies we are making use of and using we get the fire pixel. This is a recent uh, example, not very recent of course. Uh, you might be knowing that Sariska forest has a huge burning in the year of uh, 2022. Okay, at that time I was in Rajasthan, I was trying to see and I could see in the satellite data this particular area is clearly giving the signature just like this, this much area got burnt. Again there is a lot of human cry, same thing. Forest department said that 16 square kilometer area got completely burnt. When he did analysis through high resolution data, you could find that 9.23 square kilometer only. Again, you see that every moment remote sensing is doing the policing. That's why many people they don't like the remote sensing community. They say, so oh, it's a fault to hai. Ye to fault hai field mein jaate nahi, upar se sab bata dete hain. So you know, like uh, sometimes you have to face this kind of uh, you know, like uh, what should you say, the adverse situations also. Okay, uh, now the another example of remote sensing use is, again it is of your interest might be, it is basically the coastal water quality. So both the turbidity and the chlorophyll is very important for fish culture as well as for getting fish catch. And it's, you all know I need not explain that if turbidity is more oxygen and the light penetration is low and naturally the fish will not like in that environment because their food is less in that particular area. So this kind of mapping regular basis it is done and it is putting it for the uh, user department. This is also the similar kind of thing only just I wanted to know you, you will be telling me the answer I am not very sure that why in the Arabian basin the concentration is so high chlorophyll concentration. Whereas if you come to the Bay of Bengal Basin, it is uh, almost very, very low, even less than 1.7. So I don't know what is the reason, you are the better person to say, just a thought, for thought process I put it. Uh, and regular basis in the Gulf area, because in Gulf region you can see that uh, the chlorophyll content is very high. That's why Gujarat fishery man, they get a good catch, whereas Bay of Bengal, they don't get that good uh, fish landing. And uh, sir was asking in the morning, uh, the same way what we are using, the sea surface temperature, chlorophyll and wind, three input parameters readily available from the satellite data, combining and optimizing using lot of rules and logic and generating the potential fisheries zone that is called PFZ. And it is operationally being disseminated to the fisheries. Now coming to the point, today's topic is that wildlife management and how the remote sensing of the geoinformat is being used. When I did the review, interestingly I could find that there is an ample opportunity still to make use of the geoinformat. Still there is a lot of gap areas are there. Most of the uses I see, even the mapping of assets are missing. In Sundarban, which are the sweet water ponds where tiger comes to take water or drink water, I didn't see any inventory the most fundamental one. So there is a lot of mapping, inventory itself is required, forget about rest of the things. Then tracking and monitoring of the movement, I cite one example. Other day in Bandhavgar, I was told that can you plan one GIS database or GIS designing web based where the visitors can know they are how far from the tiger. I just said it is very easy, do you have a caller? Radio ID, RFID, say no, 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 you don't have. You put color if RFID, I will make the design for you and on the screen you can see, suppose you are going through this small road, Kacha road and how far the tiger is, whether you are supposed to wait there for the tiger. 
this is online live you can make it but maybe due to some reason they don't like to make it live because maybe the life will be in danger but it is possible so instead of you know like roaming here and there at the end of the day say are kuch to dikhai nahi aaj yaar bekar gaya din so it is not possible you can see or you can know that get to know that okay i am this much away from the tiger so these are one of the use i see uh, of course it may not be a productive use then habitat suitability it is being done thousand of papers you will get habitat suitability they take the suitability criteria in terms of slope soil vegetation this and that and they come out with uh, this thing with the expert opinion then habitat degradation fragmentation some studies i could see designing wildlife corridor these days a lot of studies being done climate change impact i don't see in the morning one of the faculty was talking to me and she said that she is willing to do this kind of a study a uh, good study wetland coastal management zone some studies are there monitoring of forest fire of course i said this is what is the most demanding area the zoology community my sincere request and my next slide will be on that only please do it don't think for your area only think globally act locally that is what the message i got whenever i go to fao you went they said that don't think compartmentally think for the globe global warming work you were doing climate change you were thinking only west bengal you were thinking only bihar you were thinking jharkhand is it possible it is a continuous phenomena so that is what the message is these days Uh, and the development of web-based tourism information system. These are these are what is my observation, purely mine. You can also <coughs> challenge me. Now, with this background, I will come to a study which we did. I said for the Central Asia, and for the Canadian government that locust minimum impact minimization study for the Central Asia. now uh, if you look at this map particularly you can see that about 60 countries in the world are worst affected by the uh, if i'm wrong please correct me that name is sisto sarka gregory or something like this um, uh, desert locust they call it so this many are affected and this is how it looks like when it is adults because it has a morphological change if it is the adult the color changes to yellow otherwise it is greenish so you can see the magnanimity of the problem is that 60 countries affected recession on 30 countries recession means when the weather is not favorable they sit on the ground and you see the conditions their amount of intake 2 g per day so if they sit on a particular you know like crop land overnight next day morning i have seen personally in rajasthan nothing left out even the you know like a stock everything they eat away then you have a uh, most of the damage is caused by uh, this immature adults you call it a neem for uh, something like neem no, not sorry neem it's a hopper kind of thing and then uh, the extent could be somewhere between 1 square kilometer to several 100000 just like a cloud day time it may be completely dark a locust swarm is coming and uh, the density you can see that about 40 to 80 million locust per square kilometer the unfortunate part you know this has never been introduce as a disaster i said other day ndma that why this is not under disaster because the lack of knowledge lack of something even if there is a locust burning organization in the faridabad still they never declared it as a you know like a disaster <coughs> it's very unfortunate some of the things still we ignore uh, neglect and this particular life cycle i am not going because you are all expert in that thing only i will say these are critical things 14 days egg laying to uh, like a hopper development this is the critical day during which we have to have a control measure because when the locust are less mobile then control measure is effective one it is mobile you don't know how to start where you have to end and the army is called for i don't know how many of you know army is called in rajasthan to control it because army from helicopter they do the spraying activity it's a massive activity i don't know how many of you have the experience <coughs> now indian perspective if i take example of only one year that year yas happened yas cyclone you see that uh, about uh, 1795 square kilometer of rajasthan got seriously affected and government has to declared 132 crore rupees simple relief to the farmers why i am come bringing economics in this because you then get to know the gravity of the situation and spraying of malathion how much it was spread malathion is a neurotoxin basically 
and 44,000 liters of malathion was sprayed in the air as a prophylactic control measures. This cost also 28, leaving behind all the other cost. Like human, you have to, you know, like hired human being, then vehicle, all this are leaving behind. Only this is the, and after that the entire crop is lost. That crop cost I have not added. And uh, this time we could see in the year of 20 that normally it is confined to Western part, it came up to MP and Chhattisgarh. That is the most alarming part. One day you will see in Bengal also it has come. And then it degraded, uh, due to this malathion spray, the entire environment was degraded and you know there is a huge health hazard. These are very common uh, photos uh, for you, but uh, to support my talk I need to present it. Uh, this is the OB position basically, the adult locus, the egg laying activity is going on. These are the egg pods and each egg pod that contains about 6 to 70 number of uh, eggs of course. And uh, there is a requirement. Why this requirement is important? Because a modeler modeling the environment, he needs to know what is the type of soil required because it has to burrow. Burrow and put the egg inside. So sandy soil is preferred. Soil moisture, this is the percentage is required. Soil temperature, if it is more than that, the egg will get desiccated. And then you need to have a loose soil surface with low salinity. Rajasthan is mostly saline. Some patches you will find there is no salinity. And nearby bushy or thorny vegetation. This all goes as an input, remote sensing input for modeling. That's why we have to understand the ecology also. This is of course the growth curve. I'm not going to detail because it has a second relevance. Yeah. So here what happens, like in case of the hopper development, you can see that how they hang themselves to, to remove their skeleton. So that means it gives you an idea that there should have a bushy vegetation around which, has a, which is thorny also. So this way it removes, there is a four instars and it will remove and then the immature adult will come out. This is immature adults, right? <coughs> but this immature adults are the most naughty fellows. Their movement is very less and they eat as they can. Maximum they eat at this stage only. Whereas this, uh, the, uh, when their adult is mature, then there is a complete morphological change. You can see it is almost yellowish. And then they prefer to have a long flight, even 120 to 100 kilometers they will fly. And they will settle at a location where there is a crop field. So this is their typical behavior. And here there are a group of, you know, like uh, habitat suitability parameters. I am not reading it out, but this is required for modeling of the ecology. <coughs> Now, how geospatial uh, decision support system we developed, that is we call GeoICT based, low-cost impact minimization program. <coughs> we had a different level of information which are all integrated the GIS. Like you can see all field related information comes from the remote sensing, a little bit ground survey. We have different kind of computing environment, that time itself we started using cloud. Then uh, we have different kind of synoptic information like air temperature, then pressure, the convective activities. This also comes from meteorological satellites and geostationary satellites. And the large number of the technologies are there. Of course, some of the technologies are not there, like X-band radar and all these things. Uh, but we also kept a provision that in future, when it will uh, be there, available, then you will be integrating all those things. <coughs> this chart is very important because this is a GIS activity, integration of all the layers it is doing, different kind of layers and different kind of themes. And we prefer to have WebGIS. WebGIS advantage is that, that you can make use uh, from your own system only. You need not have a separate license for that kind of thing. Then you have a growth simulation models, flight dynamics. Here we introduced basically one new concept that using the high split, that basically is a Lagrangian model, which is mostly used for air pollution. We introduced that kind of thing. And the radar also we made use of for bioflow estimation. We saw a very interesting thing that the meteorological radar, what the clutter is appearing, like in the airport there is a radar and it basically watches whether there is a bird there in that in the aircraft path or not. Right here we saw the clutter can be made use productively for the insect bioflow. So then we can take, you, take, this, adva take this advantage to map the aerial bioflow volume and mass of the insect. For example, it is the locust. <coughs> uh, this is what I was, uh, one example I am just giving you that all these input parameters which are required for locust surveillance, uh, these are all available these days freely on daily basis. 
So what else you need it? There is no data crunch. From satellite it is processed data, value added. And the high speed, what I said just few minutes back, it's a very recent, you can make use of other insects also, nocturnal insects. I am making a request to all of you, please, 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 please have attention, please. You make use of this kind of model for your different kind of nocturnal insects like mustard of feeds and many nocturnal insects. Please do it because we are improvising this with some modulations. What is that improvisation? Is that this is a passive flow model, right? Passive flow. Whereas the locust and insect, they have a combination of active and passive flow. Sometimes they will fly, then their wings will be static. They will flow away passively. So we are trying to introduce that kind of dynamism in the model to make it more robust. When you will work, you will feel the interest. So this is a kind of trajectory. You get to know, you have seen a locust here. And on the third day or suppose after this many hours, where it will reach? It will give you an idea that which direction it is moving and where it is going to descend. These are the advantage of high speed. So you understand that how many kind of technologies, modeling are involved in this to control this small insect. This is a vertical radar, basically we call this a entomological radar. Uh, now we are trying to uh, have a dialogue with the IMD that all the IMD radar's data will make use of synergistically to have a aerial bioflow over the Indian continent. <coughs> Uh, this is how the looks, our software, how it looks, uh, not going to uh, detail, but it's a modular approach of course and many new things we have introduced, OF GIS, then uh, vertical looking radar for the bioflow, then mobile applications because 10 years back there was no mobile application that much. So now we are adding all field reporting through this and non-invasive control measures also we are introducing. This is a modular approach, again this is a modular approach. And this is the logic basically, like you know that any SDSA, so this special research support system having inbuilt rules and the logics. So these are the basically rules and logics. Those who work in this direction, they can modify. Otherwise, it is broadly like this. Now, the, how the report comes like this, it will come. This is basically a simulation of the locust life cycle. It is again in the very nascent stage. Many of you will be asking me, you can challenge me because it is based on temperature and humidity only. Nothing else has been taken care. You can have many more also like uh, the input parameters to have a much better functional life cycle builder. So this way the report comes that what is the stages of breeding and how much breeding has happened, then what is the hopper development stage and what is the flight status. So this all report comes like this. Oh, it is going other side, sorry. Yeah, almost over. And the last thing we have added, recently we have taken a program with IIT Kharagpur. Um, it may be of your interest, we are trying to have an invasive control, non-invasive control. How we can puncture, puncture the tympanum or the eardrum of the locust when it is flying. It's a very innovative concept, we call this a acoustic insect repellent. It may be possible for many other insects also. You might be knowing that locust has its eardrum, I think in the forewing, below the forewing somewhere. So, it has got different frequency receptors, not like our ear. We are trying to understand that what is the surface dynamics, stress and strain relationship and in what frequency it will rupture. It will not be able to tolerate that strain, it will rupture. As soon as it gets ruptured, its dynamic aerodynamic balance gets disturbed and it will fall down on the ground. So, this is almost in the penultimate stage, we have already generated that model we have optimized the frequency that is about 275 kilohertz frequency that is ultra low frequency is working very well and uh, now copyright or patent we have already submitted for that once it come it may be used and in the last slide in conclusion i will say that uh, in the biological sciences geoinformatics have been widely used in the field of agricultural forestry water resource urban planning ocean studies but in geological science, most of the studies are limited to wildlife habitat management or sometimes the corridor mapping as well as the forest fire, not beyond that. Then there is ample opportunity exist in the field of disease and vector bone. As I said, I said in disease, now we are doing for malaria also, chikungunya malaria also, that how, to, how the vector bone disease can be modeled. The migratory bird routes and ecological drivers the need for studying the forest degradation with respect to climate change and its impact on the, on the fauna. 
and uh, one promising area where it can be made use the animal husbandry which can extensively use the geoinformatics and can play a pivotal role in uh, fostering the ecological development uh, so with this uh, i i uh, thank you all of you for having lot of patience to hear me basically odd man out i don't have any zoology background <laughs> um but thank you so much for giving me the opportunity thank you dr dotto for your illuminating lectures uh due to time constraint i just invite the three or four questions two from the students and two from faculty quick if you have any question ask dr dotto very quickly from students anyone yeah i think yeah put on the switch hello uh, yeah i am audible okay uh, sir so as you mentioned about the acoustic model you are working on of uh, to control the spread of locust so uh, is there an ethological approach uh, you people take to uh, you know uh, control the spread of locust ethological in sense the animal behavior like you mentioned the flight behavior of uh, the locust right so is there any uh, such approach in which you people think to control the spread of locust like inducing the flight behavior or in any such i am not accustomed to this uh, uh, arena so i don't know i was just curious about to ask this yeah you know like innovative areas like biocontrol i have not much idea because that okay. is not my area what we are trying to do is a non invasive when i look for the malathion spray i get really i i feel very much worried you know the amount of pollution it is creating so uh, what idea we can do from the physics background or like you know remote sensing background that you mm -hmm. know how uh, we can make them disfunct okay so that they are not able to fly further fly. Mm -hmm. now as you rightly said yes there are the cohort of ecological conditions this should be the moisture this is the vegetation mm -hmm. this is this so these are the most probable areas so that is what we call basically risk zoning so risk zoning we are doing regularly okay this unique but when it appears it will come you cannot control it will come that time our objective is that what is the best time to control the best time to control is the mobility is very less means it is just crawling so you have a limited area to spray or whatever you do but if it is the dynamic stage it has reached to the adult stage they will immediately fly 100 and kilometers away and you have no 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 scope to control it right so bio control yes i am completely ignorant i don't know but so far as this kind of control is there non invasive like uh, making there some of the functional changes yes. that of course we are doing developmental or functional in that sense yeah only our limitation is that we are not able to make a very high power transmitter because you need a very high power transmitter at least it should be able to reach up to 2 to 3 km radius Okay, so that is still in the experimental stage. We have got up to 1.5 kilometer intensity. We got it. Okay. I don't know whether I answered your question. Sure, sure, sure. Thank, Thank you. you question from faculty. Sir, I have one question. Uh, that as you are telling that uh, in Bandhavgarh, somebody is planning to track the tiger, the location of tiger, and through which the safari van will go. And I don't think it is a good practice going to be. but uh, on contrary can we use uh, this kind of sensors invasively or non invasively on elephants like in the elephant corridors where the elephants are actively moving uh, for example in north bengal in other parts of southern india where uh, we can install uh, some kind of sensors on the elephant troops and uh, the real time data can come to the uh, train drivers or the passers by they can track that some elephant troops are nearby so so they can uh, slow down their speed so can we install like this yeah you are very correct one i said that is for the mhr and i mentioned at a point of time also this may not be a good practice to know that how far the tiger is because it may have a negative consequences also so it is it is not desirable but technologically it is possible point number 1 second as you rightly said it is basically warning giving an warning you know wildlife is very close to you and your mobile app has to tell you because it is technologically absolutely possible only thing is that someone has to take initiatives that to have a rfid or the radio caller id radio caller id you have to put to all the elephants 
okay but many times the forest department don't don't allow also to put the rfid rfid because many times they i i don't know maybe below the skin or somewhere they put it not externally something like that so there may have restrictions i don't know but technologically absolutely possible what you need a rfid tag rfid will be having a definite id and you should have a pump top or suppose in your mobile a small app is required because it will be having it will make use of these location based services and it will tell you that okay these are the areas this is how you are traveling this is the area where the elephant is there absolutely possible technologically possible thank you dr dotto for time constraint i will not allowed to ask any one to ask question but if you have question you may interact with the speakers after the lecture session when you have find the laser time thank, thank you, you dr dotto thank you so much sir so our next speaker dr orijit bhattacharya he said i i c b kolkata and completed his post doctoral research at the university of larval canada currently serving as an associate professor and head department of microbiology at adamas university dr bhattacharya brings a wealth of experience and expertise to our seminar his research focus on key areas such as antimicrobial resistance molecular parasitology microbial genetics and biofilm formation dr bhattacharya has made significant strides in understanding the, and the mechanism of antibiotic resistance and the development of molecular diagnostic procedure for antimicrobial resistance infection with over 20 research papers published in international referred journal and multiple book chapter to his credit dr bhattacharya work has granted recognition and accolades in the scientific community his research project funded by prestigious organization like crb srg and ugc reflects his commitment to addressing critical challenges in microbiology as a dedicated mentor dr bhattacharya has supervised numerous postgraduate and doctoral students shaping the next generation of scientists in the field in his field he is actively involved in the professional societies such as american society of microbiology and the genetic society of america dr bhattacharya contribution to the field of microbiology extend beyond research as evidenced by his journal affiliation as a reviewer for extreme publication like plos neglected tropical disease and frontiers in pharmacology with his expertise and dedication to advancing scientific knowledge dr orijit bhattacharya is a valuable addition to our seminar and we eagerly anticipate his insights and contribution to our discussion please dr bhattacharya thank you sir uh, it's uh, quite embarrassing to listen uh, about yourself uh, too many words anyway so uh, first of all i would like to thank the organizers here to invite me and uh, giving me the opportunity you know to to share some of my thoughts with you and uh, sir professor das gupta because we had a long connection for uh, say around 15 years now and uh, really i have been blessed to to have viva as one of my mentors so uh, thank you sir thank you very much so let us start but before i start uh, uh, the topic i mean start discussing about the topic uh, let me uh, mention a kind of disclaimer that uh, the field of bioinformatics you know it's coming kind of amalgamation of uh, data science uh, and statistics and biological sciences so uh, whatever we work on we have this kind of collaborations and i normally handle the biological part of it so the kind of uh, discussion that i will have it's mostly very fundamental in terms of ai and machine learning i will not discuss about the coding part or all of those just the application and the basis of ml and ai and also i will discuss about some biological applications of ai ml in terms of the state of the art research and lastly i would like to offer you a glimpse of what we are doing with the help of ai and other tools in our laboratory so uh, let us start so artificial intelligence i guess we are all accustomed with this term it's just a kind of uh, approach to make the computer think like and do like human do right and machine learning is a kind of branch of uh, artificial intelligence where we allow the machine to learn from some data and to decide uh, what to do and to decide to classify some other data something like that 
So whatever AI ML we deal with, the primary thing is to know what data is. Now, often we, we, we mention this terminology data, but do we really know what a data is? Often, whenever I ask, because I teach bioinformatics in my university, so uh, in the first class, I always ask the students, what is, what is a data? So most of the students, they answer, it's basically some sort of information, okay? So information, of course, any information is kind of data, but for an information to become a data, it needs something more. It needs to be presented in a way which is easily understandable, and it needs to be presented in a way which can be uh, uh, dealt with some other software, or which can be dealt with by some other system. So data basically is a kind of structured information. Okay. Now, uh, just to get into the core of the topic, uh, the artificial intelligence, the popular ones that we normally, uh, you know, listen to or we normally work with, like ChatGPT, Google Gemini, or even uh, maybe DeepFake, although that's not really good. And these are all uh, categorized into generative artificial intelligence. And what is generative artificial intelligence? It's a kind of artificial intelligence where the system creates something create something from existing knowledges, create something from existing data. So it's not really kind of classifying something or deciding something, it's something beyond that. And that's why these, uh, these uh, two tools are so popular. Uh, you know Sophia, Sophia is a humanized robot and it, it's a kind of epitome of subgenerative AI where you know, uh, the system can communicate with you just like another human. So uh, this concept of artificial intelligence is not really new. You know, it, it's there since 1950, since the time of Alan Turing, uh, where uh, he actually proposed that a machine can be enabled in a way so that it will communicate with human beings just like another human being. So that's why now, if you claim that, okay, my machine is uh, uh, em uh, empowered by machine learning, you have to pass a test called a Turing test where you have to convince us that, yeah, your machine is really something close to the cognitive or intellectual power of human being. Now, let us get into uh, what actually uh, we do in terms of cognition or in terms of our intellectual ability. So for our intellectual ability, we have uh, primarily four functions. First, cognition, where we recognize something. Second, we analyze whatever we recognize, and then we decide what to do, how to act on a situation, something like that. And fourth one is, we create something, okay. So, whenever we try to make a machine behave like this, like our intellectual, you know, uh, capacity, with our intellectual capacity, so we first, we need to understand that what basically we do when we, when we learn something, okay. So to make the system learn, we must have to analyze how we learn. So just this example usually I give in my class that uh, if you first time try to learn how to take a penalty shootout, you have to think that where you will place your, 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 you know, your, your ball uh, to, to attain a goal. So maybe for that you have to judge something, then you will decide, okay, I will place it there. Then you will try and your attempt may be a success, may be a failure. Whatever your attempt is, it will be an experience for you. So after attaining the experience, you will reanalyze. So your first attempt is a data now. And then from that data, you will extract the features where you have shoot, what was the speed, uh, so something like that. How was the movement of the goalkeeper, something like that. And then you will classify the data. That means which is a success, which is a failure. And based on this experience, this analysis, you will reshoot. So again and again, you will gain experience. Again and again, you will generate newer data. And your process will be more and more efficacious, more and more efficient. Okay, so this is basically what uh, machine learning do with the system. Now there are two types of learning. Just like we do sometime for some kind of learning, we, we learn by ourselves, sometime take a shekha, uh, that we learn by ourselves with our experience, we extract some, some information, some feature, and then we apply that. And sometime it is by some other person with some advice, with some guidance, uh, some mentorship, we learn something. So similarly for, for machine learning, there are clearly two types. One is supervised learning, another one is unsupervised learning. Now for supervised learning, you see, uh, we, if you have some data, 
we have to first label the data. We have to make the computer understand what are these data, what are these objects actually. And then we have to prepare a model through which the system will analyze this data and then it will make some prediction. So with this model, it's basically a protocol where if we put something new, depending on whatever we allowed the system to learn, it will predict something, okay? So basically, uh, whatever is there, this is basically prediction. So uh, you are learning the system, you are making the system to learn how to predict. This is called supervised learning. And for uh, unsupervised learning, the whole data is unlabeled. And here, your system will categorize the data it will extract the features out of this data, which one is a circle, which one is a hexagon. And then, if you allow it to analyze a new data, this test data, it will det detect it correctly. Okay, so this is the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning. Now, uh, for making your system to, to, to learn, uh, you have, uh, we have actually, uh, people have developed different types of models. And one of the most popular and most used model is called neural networks. So I think many of us know about neural network. It is basically a program system, some algorithm and combination of some algorithms, which is allowing the, the machine, the computer, to analyze just we do for our uh, uh, cognition, just we do with our neural system. So for neural networking, you know, there are layers. So the first layer is called input where you can, you can incorporate some, some data, some experience, say with our old example, it might be the first shot, it, it might be the second shot, it might be the third shot. Then here, there is a layer called hidden layers. So in these hidden layers, you will process, you will analyze your experience. So what was the speed for the first shot? What was the position of the first shot? Then what is the function? How this position and speed combined to give you some output. So with all the uh, data that you have, you will have some decision and then with some new data, if you, if you, if you, if you are uh, uh, having the data for a new shot at goal, you will be able to predict whether that will be a success or failure. So this is basically something very similar to our uh, neural system and uh, this is basically a combination of huge amount of coding uh, and uh, a very efficient model that we have, but this is not really something that is developed only recently. Uh, in last 10 years, actually, this neural network developed a lot, but it was there uh, before. But in last 10 years, neural networks, particularly uh, the two types of neural networks that are most frequently used by different types of tools, artificial neural network and convolutional neural network, these two types of neural networks are uh, evolved, are, are developed a lot, and every day or every you know every month there is some kind of development to to have some new function with this kind of network model so that we can have a better version of uh, machine learning so this artificial what is the difference between artificial neural network and convolutional neural network it's basically artificial neural network propagates only forward way so you have some information and you are deciding. Then you have the new information you are deciding. And accumulation of those, uh, you know, decisions, then if you have some test data, you will decide something. That is basically a forward propagation uh, model for uh, artificial neural network. But for convolutional neural network, you will, you will uh, analyze whatever experience you have. So you will have a backward propagation. Every experience will have some amount of uh, effect on the analysis. So with every experience, you will put some amount of weightage on the data and then you will reanalyze the data. So uh, it, it's something like, say, say if you are uh, shooting at the goal with our old example, so if you have speed and with your initial analysis, you are, you are getting that with a certain speed, the chance of having a score is much, much higher. So you will put much more weightage on the speed and based on that weightage, your next analysis will be uh, done, it will, will be actually accomplished. So this way, convolutional neural network actually works. So this is a very strong model and, and for prediction. And these two are the most frequently used uh, models for biological you know, uh, tools. Now, uh, what uh, we have to uh, understand that for biological research so far, what 
the kind of AI we use, it's a discriminative AI, not a generative AI. Discriminative AI means if you are giving some data, it will primarily do classification. Okay, it will primarily decide what are the data that are there and how we can cluster the data into different groups. So for that, there are different tools. One tool which is quite an older one is called regression. Regression is a very old statistical strategy where two variables are associated with one another. Say speed with score or, or say speed with position of that particular shot, this kind of uh, analysis, two variables and we are analyzing two variables and how this one change in one variable can affect outcome of the other variable. So whether increase in speed is increasing the rate of success of a penalty shootout or whether reducing it is increasing the rate of success, something like that. So it is basically a regression kind of analysis. But uh, with the evolution of different approaches in, in ML, uh, there are introduction of different types of analysis and each of these analysis are uh, emboldened by uh, uh, very robust statistical approaches. Huh? So statistics is an integral part of bioinformatics. Whatever we analyze, whatever we predict, it has a strong statistical foundation. So when you will learn AI or when you will learn some amount of coding, you will understand that for every prediction, every analysis, be it a sequence analysis, be it whatever, you need a statistical package. Okay, so uh, that's uh, and that statistical package will determine how correctly you are predicting. Okay, so the next uh, 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 ML uh, model is called K nearest neighbor model. So it is basically dependent on again two variables, and here if you have a cluster of data, uh, then uh, uh, you have to, this is your training data set basically, so these are the data that you already have and then if you have a new data over here, you have to place the new data between these two clusters to make a prediction. Say so these are the shots which were a success, these were the shots which were a failure. Now you have a new shot and based on some criteria you are placing here the new shot. Say so this is speed and this may be the position. So you, you have a new data here. So whether this is close to success or close to failure that you have to predict. So how you can do that? You can do that by determining whether this is near to this cluster or whether this is near to this cluster. Now you might think that this is very easy but uh, this is not very easy for all the plot points because there will be points which would apparently look like they are equally distant from both of these clusters. So you need strong statistics to you know, categorize them. And after doing that, if you are finding out that, okay, this new, uh, the, the new data, or that means the new shot, analysis of the new shot is close to category one, which is success, then you will predict that, okay, this kind of shot might lead you to a score. So this kind of analysis is called K nearest neighbor analysis. Then there is something called decision tree. Now decision tree approach is very similar to the way we think in a stepwise manner we decide something. Similarly here in a stepwise manner the system decides something. So just for an example, say, say let us uh, have to decide, let us imagine that we have to decide that on this particular day we are going to have a party outside our house. Okay, so uh, and uh, basically what is the factor that would, would uh, uh, make us convinced that okay this is the day where we can arrange such a party. It's basically the environment, the climatic condition, weather condition. So here you can see uh, this is a kind of very uh, trivial uh, decision tree where we would analyze the first parameter whether this day is windy or not. If the day is windy, then we will have another layer of analysis. And if the day is not windy, then we have another type of analysis. So first of all, let us uh, assume that a day was not really windy. Then we thought, okay, what is the temperature? So if the temperature is quite ambient, then we will say, yes, we will have the party. If it's too cold or too hot, we will say, no, we will not have the party. Then if uh, there is another, another parameter that is called, if it is windy, then how does it look like outside? Is it sunny? Is it overcast? Or is it rainy? So if, if it is overcast, that means if, if it's not really raining, then we will say yes. But if it's sunny, then we, we, we have to decide on another parameter that if, if it's too humid or not. If it's too humid, we will sweat a lot. Uh, we will sweat a lot. And if it's less humid, we, we will have some 
convenient situation to arrange the party. So with every layer, we are making some decision. And that's why these are called decision nodes. And ultimately, where we are reaching, when there is no decision node, we call them as leaf node. So in this structure of decision tree, we have a root node. And we will move up to leaf node to get into some kind of decision. So for every decision that you have, you, you have to make, you have to have a stepwise analysis. Now there is another algorithm which is basically amalgamation of different decision trees. This is called random forest. Uh, and here as you can see there are multiple decision trees based on which you are making some prediction. And because there are multiple decision trees, say this is starting from whether the situation is windy or not. This is starting from whether it is raining or not, uh, something like that. So these decision trees will lead you to some kind of prediction with different inputs, with different days or with different uh, kind of data. So after you analyze these with these three different trees or multiple dif uh, decision trees, uh, for how many decision trees or for how many instances you are getting yes and how many instances you are getting no, based on that analysis you will decide whether a particular day is suitable for your party or not, something like that. So it is basically called random forest. Again, because it is kind of, you know, uh, joining too many trees, that's why it's a forest. And uh, you need huge support of statistics, you know, to get into a particular prediction through this kind of trees, and this kind of uh, 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 model. Now there is another model that is called support vector machine. Just to, to mention that I am just mentioning these models, I am not really uh, uh, properly elaborating those models. I have put the references where you can get, where you can log in and you can check. So there are uh, excellent web pages like Geeks for Geeks and others where you can get into and you can have the concept of these models. But if you are really inclined to learn AI, which you must have to, uh, you, you should know these terminologies and you should have some basic concept of this kind of models. Okay. So support vector machine, again, it's a quite old model. It's basically a model where we classify different data sets that we might have obtained through our learnings in a 3D coordinate or in a multidimensional coordinate. Say uh, we, we, are, we are getting a data for uh, for an, for, for an incidence where, which is affected by different variables. So for our, uh, uh, say for our uh, first example, uh, a success in a penalty shootout might depend on different things. It's the efficiency of goalkeeper, it's the uh, speed of your shot, it's the position of your shot and other things. So if you have to put your data in a 3D coordinate, so this coordinate may be position, this may be the speed, this may be position of the goalkeeper or whatever, and you will have our data like this for all the attempts that you made. Now what you have to do, you have to distinguish between the successes and failures. For that, in the three dimension here, you have to prepare a plane which we call a hyperplane, which is, will clearly discriminate between these different data points in 3D. And then, with a new attempt, you have to see where this new attempt is placed, whether it's placed above the hyperplane or lower the hyperplane. So like this, you will be able to predict something. And why this is called support vector machine? Because it is assumed that this hyperplane is prepared based on the data points that are nearer to the hyperplane. So these data points actually serves as a support vector for the hyperplane. Where it should be located, how it should be oriented, that depends on the closest data point. So it's called a support vector machine. So all of these three, support vector machine, random forest decision tree, K, uh, nearest neighbors, uh, these are all supervised learnings. You need training data set for that. And then there is another approach which is called K-main clustering. This approach is called unsupervised clustering or this is a kind of unsupervised learning model. Again, here you have a huge number of data points here and you have to classify these data points into different clusters. So what it does, claiming clustering does, it uses an approach called centroid generation. So what it will do with this data point, it will generate, if you ask the, the system to make three clusters here, so it will generate three clusters by imagining there are three central points or three centroid points. And how these centroid points are determined? It is determined on the basis of that, that from this point, the, there are some 
dots or some data which are close to this point there are some dots and some data which are close to this point and some dots and some data which are close to this point so if you want to have three clusters you have to measure from this particular point what is the distance of the data points and based on that you can have three clusters and one of these three clusters can be say uh, whether uh, your your uh, uh, say you, if if you are identifying a bacteria these, some of these clusters can be whether it is E. coli, whether it's the bacillus, or whether it is something else. So uh, maybe based on two different criteria, say gram staining and some other criteria, you, you, you can put this kind of a cluster. And by making some centroid based on the data, you can predict whatever you have for a new bacteria that you are making. But why it's unsupervised? Because every time you this system is making a centroid. I'm not instructing the system to make a centroid over there. The centroid is made by the system using the help of the data structure that, that is there. So here, we are not really asking, we're not labeling that, OK, this is E. coli, this is bacillus, this is something else. It is the system which is extracting the features out of these data points, and it is putting the centroid and clustering the data. That's why it's called unsupervised algorithm. And there are very uh, good unsupervised algorithm that are called k-means and k-means++ that are used in different Python programs to, to have you know, this kind of prediction. Now, uh, so far, I have uh, what I have discussed is different types of predictions. But whatever prediction we made, say uh, tomorrow you are preparing some algorithm, some some tools for predicting something, then someone might ask you that how good your tool is. For that, you have to have some analysis. So, how good your prediction is? It has basically four parameters: how many true positive predictions your your model makes how many false positive prediction your model means, makes, false negative, and true negative. So you know, true positive means some incidence is happening in real life, and, re and it is predicted as it is by your model. So that is true positive. And false negative is some incidence is not taking place, and your model is uh, uh, predicting that it will not take place. So these two are the correct uh, you know, situations. And then there can be situations like you, you can have true negative and you can have false positives where either your prediction is, is, is making wrong or the scenario is not favored by your prediction. I mean, scenario is not as you have uh, made your prediction. So you can have either true negative or you can have false positive. But based on these four uh, data, you can calculate the accuracy, the sensitivity, the specificity, the correlation coefficient, and precision and recall. All of these one, two, three, four, five, six parameters, six terms are very important to validate a prediction model or to validate a machine learning model. So you have to remember what sensitivity is, what accuracy is, what specificity is. These are not really how we normally define them colloquially. These are statistical terms. What we get from our prediction, the data we get from our prediction, based on that, we can calculate these parameters. So, so far, this is what I had to discuss about the basic uh, fundamentals of machine learning. Now I am getting into the applicative part, particularly in biological sciences. So the most common applications in for of machine learning is basically image analysis. So most of the ML predictions or most of the usable ML tools that are there uh, on bench for clinicians, uh, they are basically uh, image analysis tools. And uh, uh, every day there have been immense advancement of this image analysis tool. So now uh, from a tumor, the chance of malignancy of the tumor, that can be predicted. From the, uh, from the structure of the RBCs, the, the, the chance of getting infected with malaria, that can be predicted. So image analysis can do a lot of things. Now, each of these predictions might not be as accurate or as precise or as sensitive, but people are trying to make it more and more uh, sensitive. So uh, uh, we have uh, one algorithm, uh, one, one uh, model uh, of AI where from face you can determine what kind of genetic disorder is there. One proof is there, we know that Down's, Down syndrome, there is, a, there, there is a specific facial feature. So uh, we can distinguish between a Down syndrome patient and a normal individual just by visualizing, just by visualizations. But uh, there are different types of physical feature which are 
frequently associated with some other types of genetic disorders like Turner syndrome, Angelman syndrome, something like that. So uh, using huge number of data, huge number of different images, this model is trained to predict if there is a kind of facial feature, there is how much probability is there for that patient to, uh, to be a, a genetic disorder. Okay, so this kind of prediction is there. The second uh, most frequent is predicting what kind of cancer will be there in a patient. So it's a kind of genetic prediction. You can have different uh, data like, like you can have some, some uh, uh, blood and tissue data. So this can be image data or some other kind of uh, data. You can have sequence data or uh, uh, your metabolom metabolomics data. So uh, multiple omics data that can be there. There can be some imaging data from some organs and there can be risk factor assessment. So all of these factors, uh, they, they may be, uh, uh, you know, the, they may be uh, allow you to build up a model through artificial intelligence and any of these input can make you predict what is the chance of a person to be genetically predisposed to a particular type of cancer. So these kind of uh, models are already available and in fact commercially available, people are using these kind of models now. And lastly, you know, there are one of the detection for, for cancers now is uh, sort of less invasive uh, liquid biopsy. So it's basically from the liquid fractions, be it serum, be it urine. Uh, here people detect the circulatory RNA, the uh, circulatory DNA that are there in our liquid samples. They sequence it and through that sequencing, they can predict that whether there is cancer or not or what kind of cancer is there or not or even what kind of drug can be prescribed to that particular patient or not. So, because uh, these uh, circulatory DNAs are coming out of different types of cells, so if they are coming out of some tumor cells, specific type of tumor cells, if there are specific biomarkers or even specific signatures, that can be analyzed by your machine learning uh, 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 model and they can make very good prediction. So, for all of these, we are, we are having a definite uh, tool and those are being sold for clinicians. But for research, the scenario is a bit different because for biological research, we work with big data and our big data basically is sequence and structures. So both for sequence analysis, genetic analysis, identifying different types of genetic variations, we are frequently using uh, machine learning and this is not really recent, we are using it for long and now it has developed so much so that we can analyze something very faster than we used to do before. So for, for sequence analysis, we are using different types of machine learning and here actually this uh, convolutional neural network uh, primarily plays a key role. So we prepare models based on CNN and then we can make some analysis, some prediction and also for structure, this is huge. So for predicting structure of a protein is very, very important and earlier we had to predict the structure based on homology of a protein with the structure of some protein for which someone has performed NMR or cryo-electron microscopy or crystallography which are real world structure determination experiments. But for all the proteins we cannot perform X-ray crystallography for many reasons. It can be the protein's chemical nature, it can be uh, some, some, some other issues, solubility, uh, that is also uh, physical chemical nature. So there can be different aspects which will not allow us to have crystals for all the proteins. But now with the help of artificial intelligence, they are, we have developed a tool, I will come to the tool, uh, where we can predict structure of different proteins and if we can have a real life structure of different proteins, we can design drugs against the protein. So artificial intelligence presently has immensely boosted drug development by allowing prediction of numerous number of uh, proteins for which uh, might be there was no, no scope of uh, determining structure by experiment or it would have taken 20-25 years to have structures for all of those proteins. So AI and drug discovery, here uh, there are uh, six different aspects where we are frequently using AI and drug discovery. So first of all, to identify a biomarker or target for a particular uh, drug development for a disease. Then for optimizing drug target interactions, then pharmacokinetics prediction, how a drug is getting into our system, how a drug will be metabolized by us, how long it will sustain in our system, this kind of prediction. Then there is designing of drug-like molecule. This is called pharmacophore designing. This is a very important application. Then clinical trial designing. This is also very important because whenever you prepare a drug, the last stage 
before marketing a drug is the clinical trial. So you have to apply it on particular type of patients, volunteers. And uh, what kind of volunteers you should have, how many volunteers you should have, how many males, how many females, how many volunteers from different ethnicity, how many volunteers of different types of MHC alleles that you have, that you should have in your clinical trial, that is very important. So uh, for having a good sample for clinical trial, now people are using uh, AI uh, uh, to, to have to map the kind of clinical trial that you will do. And that is a very, very important application nowadays. And lastly, prioritization because AI allows us to prioritize one particular molecule over another or one particular target over another and it can make a list of those prioritized targets or molecules so even that is used for drug discovery so all of these uh, six different approaches that are frequently you know uh, adopted uh, uh, with AI for having a good a better drug now as I mentioned for AIML drug designing I will try to uh, discuss on two aspects one is protein, protein structure modeling another one is pharmacophore designing let us get into the pharmacophore designing first so this is a basic schema of computer aided drug designing you might have heard of computer drug designing where we have a structure as I mentioned it can be a model or it, it can be an experimental designed uh, structure and then we will analyze binding interaction with a candidate molecule which can be a drug so we will perform molecular docking and we will score the docking then another aspect is ligand based drug designing where we will identify a ligand this ligand is called pharmacophore. Now ligands are small molecules which have a definite receptor within your cell. So the receptor can be a protein, it can be RNA, whatever, but uh, it's a small molecule. So there are, uh, there, are, there are programs like quantitative structure activity relationship, QSAR, uh, that has been used for long to design a pharmacophore. But now with the pharmacophore structure, we can use ML models to prepare a good pharmacophore which can make this interaction with your protein in a more, uh, more efficient way or which can make this interaction more favorable. So your drug will work in a better way. So these kind of approaches are adapted and this is uh, the basic uh, computer drug designing and uh, on every, on, on almost every step you can apply AI but I will discuss about this pharmacophore designing and structure uh, modeling. Okay. So uh, for pharmacophore uh, designing, you know, so uh, pharmacophore designing requires something that is called virtual screening. Now, you know, we have huge number of molecules, 10 to the power 7, 10 to the power 8 molecules in our databases, which can be a drug. So virtual screening means if you have a target, say if you are targeting a kinase for uh, designing a drug against a cancer, so the target is the kinase structure structure of the protein kinase and then you are screening all of those 10 to the power 7, 8 molecules uh, in one shot. This is called virtual screening. So virtual screening we, we perform and we determine the drug likeliness that means how well it's binding and we perform the ADME and toxicity analysis how toxic the drug is, uh, how toxic the molecule is because if a molecule is toxic it cannot be a drug. So for those kind of prediction we can use uh, machine learning. Then we can, if we have the molecular structure, structure of our small molecules, we can predict that how similar the structure is with some antibiotic, how similar the structure is with some other drug uh, which is available in market. So for those kind of prediction, we can always use uh, machine learning and, and also we can uh, predict the kind of function, biological function uh, the drug might have apart from aiming its own target, say if you are targeting a, a, a kinase for treating cancer, then what can be the other impacts? That can also be some important consideration while designing pharmacophores. So that can also be done using machine learning. Okay. So what we do basically, here you have a simple docking structure, you know, this is the ligand, this is the small molecule which, is, which can be a drug and this can be our kinase. So it, it's sitting in this particular pocket. Now here, how it's sitting in this particular pocket? Through some weak interaction hydrogen bonds, hydrophobic interactions, hydro, and then there can be electrostatic interaction, whatever. So what we try to do is we can optimize those interactions by changing the side chains of uh, this particular uh, molecule, uh, the functional groups of this particular molecule, which can make it a better interactor with this target, which eventually can make it a better protein. So this kind of designing can be done. It was done earlier, but before when it was done, it was kind of a very tedious job. And also you have to kind of try 
trial and error uh, steps were too much because you were replacing a methyl group with some aldehyde group or something and so on and so forth. So you have to do a lot of work. But now with prediction of uh, through AIML, we can do it quite efficiently in a, a smaller time. So we can try huge number of molecules as pharmacophores. So uh, this is a paper which is a very interesting paper. This, this came up in 2019, uh, uh, five years back in Nature Communication. So here actually they developed a pharmacophore guided uh, deep learning approach to design better drugs. So, so uh, if you can, you can go through this paper and uh, uh, you, can, you can really enjoy it. So pharmacophore designing is, is something I hope uh, it, it's quite clear now. And then there is the uh, alpha fold that is basically the, the phrase of these five years of this particular decade. So uh, this is called a discovery for the decade so far and Forbes particularly entitled this discovery of alpha fold as the best AI made model that we can make uh, that, that actually people have made so far. So alpha fold was uh, 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 again a uh, neural network based AI assisted model to predict structure of proteins. Okay. So alpha fold was initially uh, developed by a company called DeepMind. Now Google and DeepMind they collaborate together to maintain alpha fold. And what is alpha fold? Alpha fold actually uh, is not using typical homology modeling kind of approach. As I discussed, if a sequence is similar to another sequence for which we know structure, then the structure of the sequence might be similar. This kind of approach is not there. Here they are using a neural network prediction. Uh, they have named it as EvoFormer and this EvoFormer, they have integrated it with sequence alignment and they have integrated in how the atoms are organized in different uh, known proteins for which structure is known but not really like a homology modeling. So it's kind of threading and also something else they are doing but it's basically they are predicting the protein structure with huge accuracy. So AlphaFold uh, is uh, implemented in, in for different organisms, for almost all organisms, all the proteomes, now alpha fold is there. And there is a database now, this is called alpha fold protein structure database. So say if you want to check whether there is a casein kinase in, in plasmodium, and you can just type casein kinase in plasmodium over here and you will get the structure. So alpha fold database, it, it is getting bigger and bigger every day, more and more, more structures are generated by alpha fold. And the predictions are quite good because we assess different type of structures. So uh, usually they pass the quality parameters, the structures that are detected by alpha fold. So it's a very, very important uh, 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 tool to know for you guys. And uh, uh, of course, someday or the other, you will use alpha fold. Uh, one of the major use of alpha fold is in drug development. So people have been uh, trying to uh, develop drugs here and there are some success stories like this. So alpha fold, they made some structure of some uh, CDK20 and through this uh, approach, they have developed some small molecule inhibitors of CDK20. So even the structure based drug designing is becoming a success for alpha fold. Now the question is uh, uh, whether you can use alpha fold because it's, it's costly, there is some cost associated with it, but you can have the taste of it because there is a platform in Google, this is called uh, Cola Fold, which is hosted by Google. You can get into there with your Google ID and you can paste your protein sequence over here and you can generate your, your uh, structure, you know. So uh, usually in Co uh, Cola Fold, what our experience is, the structures are not as accurate accurate as alpha fold db but still uh, uh, it is uh, it, it 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 works you know some way or other it, it works so uh, cola fold is something that is uh, that you can you can try with your computer but just uh, to, there is a caution that it's not as accurate as usual alpha fold which you can buy so uh, this is uh, something that uh, uh, you should have known now because my, I mentioned vaccine development there, so vaccine development, we know there are two types of approaches. One was experimental, so just like Sir Edward Jenner did, so with the organism or some inactivated molecule, you can generate the, the uh, immunity, you can develop some immune memory. That's one kind of approach. Another kind of approach is called reverse vaccinology. This was introduced after we, uh, we have, we had uh, substantial number of whole genome sequencing data. Okay, so with whole genome sequencing data, we can predict the proteome of an organism, what are the proteins that are there, and then our work starts from there, because from those proteome, we determine how many of those proteins can be a candidate vaccines, and what are the active epitopes, 
and what are the properties of active epitopes, whether they are B cell epitopes, whether they are T cell epitopes, what are their antigenicity, allergenicity, toxicity, solubility, everything we can predict. And here comes the role of our uh, machine learning models. So if we can identify different uh, epitopes here, we can combine those epitopes and then we can allow the combined epitope to prepare a multi-epitope vaccine which can be used for further testing on animal before its translational application. Okay. So this is frequently done, this is reverse vaccinology and for this we are using AIML. Uh, frequently. So all of those neural networking, support vector machines, all of those models are used for this kind of prediction. So here uh, there is a list, actually this list was done by one of my students, so uh, this, this was published as a book chapter uh, in 2020. So uh, this is a very comprehensive list for different tools that you can use to uh, predict epitopes. And this is another list, this is prepared by Kaushik and uh, their group. Uh, this is the immunogenicity prediction tools uh, and you can see here they are using uh, KNN and uh, they are using SVM, so different types of neural networking and support vector vision. Some is using random forest here. So these tools are using different machine learning approaches to make uh, vaccines against different organisms. So this was, the, this was our uh, book chapter that I am mentioning uh, uh, where you can find out the complete list of that uh, epitope prediction tools. So uh, uh, for with this reverse vaccinology, some questions have been asked for many years that, okay, reverse vaccinology is theoretically it's good, but whether it is able to make some really good vaccines. So uh, before, uh, earlier it was not really, the answer was a straightforward no, because we are yet to develop an effective vaccine with reverse vaccinology. But now really we can develop a vaccine or at least our vaccine development process can be expedited by reverse vaccinology as it was done for the Pfizer version of uh, COVID-19 vaccine, the uh, Moderma. For that they used huge amount of reverse vaccinology to develop some mRNA vaccines. So reverse vaccinology is really assisting vaccine development today. Uh, this is one of the data just for your uh, uh, understanding that this is one of the data from our lab where we are designing uh, some of the uh, uh, multi of vaccine for scrap typhus. So from the scrap typhus proteome, we identified uh, several epitopes we combined to generate some of those uh, uh, multi epitope of vaccines. This is the structure predicted by alpha fold, of course. And these are the B cell epitopes which will be, which we expect that this will be able to generate some memory if we try this vaccine on animals. So the animal trial part is not done yet, but we have predicted some epitopes using this machine learning approaches. Now uh, I will uh, get into the uh, um, antimicrobial resistance part because it is very important and I feel it's my duty to uh, aware uh, about antimicrobial resistance to everyone because uh, we are now, uh, we are actually, uh, we have actually used out all of the options for many of the bacterial pathogens, you know. So uh, we don't have a new antibiotic for more than 10, 12 years and all the antibiotics that we had, the bacteria has become resistant against all the antibiotics. So now, if someone is admitted to a hospital, he or she might not die due to cardiac arrest or cancer or whatever. He or she might die due to some hospital acquired infections because there is dearth of antibiotic, antibiotics now. So uh, here uh, in 2017, who actually warned us that there are bacteria for which there is no antibiotic and we call these bacteria as extremely resistant pathogens or pan-resistant pathogens where no existing antibiotic can work. So you'll be surprised because we work with clinical samples. So uh, the last resort antibiotic that we had was colistin very effective antibiotic. But even now, even in Kolkata, there are huge number of colistin resistant uh, Klebsiella and Acinetobacter infections that are coming up. So we are determining every day that uh, the number before, because when I started a project in 2022, uh, the convention, the, the belief was that there is no Acinetobacter which is colistin resistant in this part of India. But now we are having call resistant within one year. So you can imagine how fast this antibiotic resistant, resistance is spreading. So the day is not far when colistin would stop working for Acinetobacter. So already it has stopped working for, for stopped working for several cases and they are recommending different other combinations which might work, might not work. So antibiotic resistance is a very, very, very uh, important uh, 
research area for now. We need some urgent intervention from our part. So uh, you can see this is the timeline for antibiotic discovery. This is the golden period between 1950 to say 2000. A lot of antibiotics were discovered. But after 2016, there is no, no real antibiotic that is uh, made available to the clinics for us. And we are almost losing this evolutionary arms race where uh, bacteria is basically winning. And if you consider data, so uh, antimicrobial resistance is currently estimated to cause over 700,000 deaths annually. So this much death just for a bacterial infection acquired through hospital admission, okay. And then it is also projected to cause 10 million deaths per year by 2050 if we don't have a new antibiotic immediately, okay. So, okay. So uh, uh, that's why uh, we need the help of machine learning and everything. So for AMR research, we are using machine learning for predicting uh, diagnosis of different uh, resistant pathogens for the surveillance, for vaccine development, drug development, uh, clinical care, which antibiotic we should prescribe when, and then antibiotic stewardship, that means how we should preserve our antibiotics, how to stop use of some antibiotics for some years, and then we can reintroduce the antibiotic. This kind of planning we should have. So uh, for that, for identifying novel antimicrobials, people are using AI. So they are identifying new genes that are called biosynthetic gene clusters in different uh, organisms from soil and other sources. And they are identifying new small molecules, which they are validating as candidate antibiotic, which can bind to different targets, as well as which can be effective against different uh, uh, bacteria. So this kind of approach is there. And this prediction is made through different uh, AI models, and which are most of the time the prediction is good. And um, also there is something called drug repurposing. So there are some other drugs which act against some different uh, diseases that is also being repurposed as antibiotic against bacteria. And those kind of predictions are also made by AI. So that is something that is important. And then there is also AI-assisted antimicrobial peptide discovery. So actually, I, I, I would not have preferred to include this part here. But because there is a new concept that is called molecular de-extinction, uh, what is molecular de-extinction? Say, uh, during evolution, as human being, we lost some of our genes. And among those genes, there are some components which are innate components of innate immune system, like some natural antimicrobial peptides that we produce. So from the Neanderthal and other genomes, we can predict what were the uh, machineries that they used when they didn't have any antibiotic. So uh, people have identified different parts, different genes, different antimicrobial peptides, and uh, through, through basically uh, machine learning based approaches, uh, using their genomic data and then predicting whether this peptide can be antimicrobial peptide or not. And uh, they, are, uh, they have really shown that uh, they, they can be antimicrobial peptides. So there are softwares, different softwares, where we can predict different types of antimicrobial peptides. This is one of those, this is a little newer ones, and uh, this is uh, reportedly is working well. Now, uh, uh, just to mention uh, some success of, of this deep learning approach and antibiotic discovery, this was a paper published in 2020 where they actually screened 10 to the power 7 or more molecules and they came to a molecule that is called helicin, which is repurposed, a repurposed drug which is the structure of which is not mimetic to any antibiotic, but this is functioning as an antibiotic against most of the pathogens. So the discovery was made by the, the use, extensive use of AIML, again neural networking, and uh, different types of novel neural network model that they developed. And this is the drug which is killing different pathogens and it is also active against the resistant pathogens. So they reported and they have uh, uh, considered this halicin as a potent antimicrobial. So probably it is in the phase three trial right now. So maybe this can come to the clinic uh, uh, in some years. So in our lab, what we do, basically we use uh, machine learning First of all, to analyze different bacterial pathways and genetic loads to prioritize some bacterial pathways. 
then we analyze the products, different products, cluster them based on their physicochemical parameters. We analyze uh, some of the, their biological aspects like quorum sensing analysis, antibiofilm activity, and also nowadays there is something called persistent cells which are not resistant but tolerant to high level of antibiotic. So we are screening antiparsistent molecules. So we have already screened some of the molecules and now we are using some ML modeling to make it a better antiparsistor. So uh, this is one of the work that is ongoing in our lab. We have published a small part of it recently, but uh, the main part is yet to get published. So this is where we are using AI in, in, in my lab. And then we are also using some drug repurposing, uh, particularly for kinase inhibitors against bacteria as well as in protozoa, leishmania. So here we, we, we prioritize several uh, 12 FDA approved drugs against leishmania. And we found out that some of those drugs can really bind well with some essential MAP kinases. So this is basically the analysis, the clustering analysis. And we found out that three drugs, sorafinib, imatinib, and another P38 MAP key inhibitors, they are really functional against uh, leishmania, both in vitro and in animal models. So now again we are analyzing the pharmacophore optimization for these drugs because these are anti-cancer drugs but those are very toxic also. So we are attempting to reduce the toxicity and we will recheck whether still it is, uh, uh, it is effective against in vivo models of leishmania or not. So this is how we are using AI in our laboratory, in our small laboratory. So Again, you can see how AI is helping us every day. So uh, I must acknowledge ACRB and ICMR. They are uh, basically uh, funding our laboratory. Whatever we are doing, it's because of them. My university who has uh, provided me a space to work uh, in and uh, uh, also some students who are really good. Then the members of my lab, these PhD students, and we had some uh, more, so I forgot to include them. I must beg apology to them. Uh, my school, School of Life Science Biotechnology, and all the open source software and server providers because there are a bunch of uh, uh, really uh, uh, generous people who develop softwares every day and make those available to us through platforms like GitHub or even as web server where we can perform our analysis. So they are really uh, advancing science by their effort, by their noble effort, and I must acknowledge them. So uh, and lastly, I must thank you for your patience. Uh, and I'm not sure whether I'm able to convey whatever I wanted to, but uh, in the biological science and application of AI and the biological science, it's uh, really mesmerizing. So, just for a quick two question from the audience, Can because I time question? is running short. Uh, hello, doc Dr. Bhattacharya. Uh, you have explained very well uh, the theoretical concept of AI and machine learning. I basically work in the field of computational drug discovery. And I want to know, my question is, uh, if I want to incorporate AIML in my work, uh, how should I start? Should I start learning Python or coding? Or is there any software available based on AI? which uh, could be used in this war yeah. so and yeah. how much computational power is required to run this software yeah that is my uh, question. first first of all yeah the very pertinent questions first of all uh, there are servers not only softwares but servers are available where just you put your data it will predict something for you but uh, you know it's always better to know the basis know what is running on know the parameters and for me the starting point must be python you know, Python. so Python, yeah. So for any student, I recommend my students to start with Python. So I'm not a master of Python, but I learned a bit of it. So, uh, but uh, at least one should learn Python to an extent where they can know what a code is. So yeah. how the software is going, what are the parameters that they are fixing, what kind of matrix they are using. So this kind of knowledge is required. So Python is a good starting point and followed by some basic AIML training maybe that, that, that could help. But and the computational power, it depends on the tool that you are using. It depends on how deep you are studying. So if you are studying with zillions of molecules, then of course you need a cluster at least, a good cluster. And, uh, but uh, usually with a smaller number of molecules, you can perform with a good RAM and uh, normal uh, laptop. You can, you can workstation or HP workstation, system? yeah, perfect, perfect. We are, we are doing it with workstations with uh, some of the available, uh, you know, there are some packages. Like there is a company now, Prescience in Silico. They are offering something similar to Strodinger now. So it's, it's low cost. So you can talk with them. It's, it's low cost. And they give you some trial period also. Okay. So we are in that trial period only. We will buy probably in future. So they, they are helping a lot. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, from student. So thank you, sir. I am a first year geology student from Ramakrishna Mission Vidya Mandir. So I just heard that you said that 
uh, in cancer detection, we are using the skin patterns uh, of the skin cancer uh, to the healthy individuals. Uh, not actually skin pattern. It can be the pattern of the, you know, the tumor, you, how your cells are organized inside a tissue is visualized by staining. So that has a particular pattern for different cancers. And from that pattern, people are trying to identify whether there is chance of malignancy or not. And that's those kind of features that can be extracted, yeah. And uh, skin, maybe skin can be some good indicator. There are, uh, uh, you know, uh, people who are trying to develop tools, might have developed also. I'm not really aware. I'm not really working with images, so I'm not really aware. But uh, they are also working with skin texture to predict a lot of things. Even, in fact, diabetes and those kind of predictions are available probably now. Now, uh, from the analyzing the skin pattern and everything. But yeah. Sir, my main question is that how much accurate this process is? Yeah, that depends on uh, the amount of data that they use for as training data set, you know. So if you are using a uh, training data set of 10, and then if you are analyzing that, okay, this skin color, this guy is diabetic, and this skin this guy is not diabetic, so only with 10, it will not, you will not, never be able to train a software in a good way, you know. So, uh, you have to have sufficient amount of data, and then you can reach prediction accuracy. To my knowledge, I know there are uh, tools which have attained prediction accuracy from 55 to 60 percent only. Okay, so maybe uh, we need a lot of more precision, a lot of, you know, fine tuning with the tools for, for gaining a better view of this, this kind of prediction. Thank you, Arijit, uh, for your wonderful talk. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Head to our next session. I would like to take a moment to um, show my gratitude to all of you for keeping your enthusiasm. So now I would like to uh, welcome our next chairperson, Dr. Shumithom Chaudhary, on stage. And uh, please, sir, come on stage. And while he said we are setting up the stage, I would like to quickly go over his extraordinary profile. Um, he is a highly accomplished scientist and ac academician with, a, with an illustrious career spanning over 38 years in ecological sciences and fishery sciences. Dr. Hom Choudhury's contribution to the field are unparalleled with over 180 publications and extensive teaching experience of 33 years. He has mentored numerous PhD and MPhil students, demonstrating his commitment to nurturing the next generation and researchers. With his specialization in ecological sciences and fishery sciences, his current research program focuses on sustainable aquaculture technology, genetic diversities of riverine fish, and community structure in zoo planktonic population. His work not only contributes to our understanding of ecological dynamics, but also conservation challenges. In addition, Dr. Hom Choudhury has held key administrative positions and undertaken numerous special assignments, showcasing his leadership and commitment to his work. His involvement in organizations such as National Commission for Clean Ganga, and the Zoological Society of Kolkata highlights his dedication to environmental conservation and academic excellence. Sir, I would like you to please say a few words in front of these students and our fellow faculties. Thank you, sir. Should I go there? Or? Yeah. Everybody, uh, I'll start with a personal feeling with thanks to Ashutosh College and RK Mission Belur Vidya Mandira for giving me exposure to this exciting seminar. In fact, uh, while coming to this institution, it's like homecoming to me because the Vedic chants that I have been listening to in the morning session reminded me of my school days in Narendrapur Ramakrishna Mission. In fact, uh, we have been listening to exhilarating lectures by uh, very young scientists and very forward-looking scientists and it's very exciting indeed to know about the prospects and the potentials of AI in biological science 
because we know that with the introduction of the biophysical principles and the chemical principles in biological study, there is no doubt that biological science has developed to a large extent with the incorporation of multidisciplinary approaches into the biological science. So therefore, as this technology has come into being, we must incorporate this also in future to make the biological science more exciting, more predictable. But at the same time, when I talk about predictability, I also mean about some kind of apprehension also. Because we know biological systems and also the environmental systems uh, in which we see the application of AI, biological systems and environmental systems are all in uh, a system. It is a concept of a system in which there are interactions of components to make it an equilibrium or a stable system always, everywhere at each category of biological system and the environmental system we find stability and equilibrium is brought about by the interaction of the components within it. But we must remember the stability and equilibrium in the biological system, in the environmental system is not very clearly understood because it is in the, in the conditions of metastability, it is a metastable and quasi-equilibrium. Metastability, I mean to say, it remains stable both in biological systems as well as in environmental systems that it is metastable. Metastable means when only interactions between components occur, then only it becomes stable. So it is metastable only if interactions are permissible. And it is also called as quasi-equilibrium because the equilibrium takes place very slowly. Normally, the interactions within the environment and biological beings, we call it stochasticity, random fluctuations, both demographic and environmental stochasticity is present. And because of the stochasticity, there is a lot of chaos in biological systems, in environmental systems. Out of these chaotic interactions, you know, ultimately a order develops and that is as quasi-equilibrium. That is equilibrium taking place very, very slowly. So it is a metastable, quasi-equilibrium biological system and environmental system. Therefore, applying AI technology should have some apprehensions as well. So these things will have to be taken care of. I have been looking into the abstracts in the abstract book. Very interesting uh, observation of mine is that people are being interested in doing or using this technology in the biological science. So on the one hand, we have so much of exciting potentials that we see and also apprehensions because we'll have to be very, very careful in applying it for predictability of the biological and environmental systems. With this excitement and apprehensions, we have a very young speaker today for the third session, Dr. Vim Dad Joshi from uh, Zoological Survey of India. I will request an introduction of Dr. Vim Dad Joshi and then we'll request him to deliver his lecture. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your questions, Dr. Bhim Dutt Joshi. Presently, uh, he is scientist C at Zoological Survey of India. Um, and he has more than 13 years of experience in uh, researching on population genetics, ecology, integrated taxonomy, wildlife forensics, phylogeography, and capacity building. He has published more than 70 research articles in different journals and have studied varied aspects of 17 mammals, seven fishes, and two birds in different regions in India. Without further ado, I will pass the mic to Dr. Da. Joshi.
Uh, with your permission, I would like to start my presentation. First of all, I thanks to Ashutosh College uh, Organizing Committee and Ramakrishna Mission Vidya Mandir, Belur, for inviting uh, me, especially on behalf of Geological Survey of India. Uh, thank you so much. So as uh, we have uh, clear from the uh, title of this uh, symposia, the use of GIS and AI in the biological sciences. So it is very pertinent to, in the current scenario, that uh, the, we are using the GIS and artificial intelligence in the wildlife conservation, especially uh, modeling and the different, uh, understanding the different aspects, especially behavior of the species, how they are uh, utilizing the space in the ecosystem and uh, how they are responding to the climate change in the different ecosystem of the India. Geological Survey of India is working on the faunal uh, diversity of India, mapping and inventorizing the entire faunal group that is present in India with the help of its 16 regional center distributed throughout India, including the Andaman Nicobar. So my topic of uh, today's is the gen GIS strategy for the effective biodiversity conser conservation and the monitoring. So conservation has two aspects. One is the monitoring and first is the gathering the data from the different sources. And that too integrating with the spatial representation with the bio biomolecules and to understand the movement pattern of the species. So I have divided my talk into majorly four parts, backgrounds where we will talk about the relevance of the biodiversity in the conservation. Another is the key data formats and types of data that we are using for processing. Third is the use of GIS in different fields with respect of biodiversity. And fourth is the study design, sample collection, and the methods as I instructed by the Dr. Nandi based on the, our audience present in this conference. And th uh, fifth will be the explain with the different uh, aspects and uh, uh, the different case studies. We will uh, discuss those, said that how we are using the GIS in these tools, right? So significance of biodiversity is a crucial uh, for the ecosystem health and uh, and human well-beings, uh, rapid changes in the human lifestyles uh, threaten the biodiversity globally. Ba basically, the habitat loss, habitat fragmentation, climate change, illegal hunting, and the anthropogenic activities. These are some key factors that is um, uh, declining the biodiversity throughout the region. Now, the GIS in the biodiversity conservation, how we can implement, basically we are using it for all the aspects to mapping, uh, to inventorizing the species, to get the ecological inferences, and the view, finally getting data on the species presence, their ecological covariates, management analysis, and the visualization of the geospatial data in different respects, which the different managers and managers and stakeholders can use for the biodiversity conservation, right? So importance of the spatial data in the biodiversity conservation is that how different habitat of the species is distributed. Another is how species and the population community are spaced in the ecosystem and about the ecosystem dynamics, how the ecosystem is performing with the help of different components that are present biotic and the abiotic in the, that particular ecosystem. So what is GIS? GIS, as in the first lecture, uh, first speaker already has, uh, you know, uh, given the detailed uh, uh, aspects of the GIS, but I will take few of things, like GIS is the technology that uses to view and analyze the data from geographic perspective. Like, uh, if I am interested to get the GPS location of particular one species from here to the another place, so I will note it down either for the, uh, whatever the kind of information I required for about that species, that particular habitat, it is, I will collect it through the GPS coordinate. This technology is piece of organizational overall information system. What is the component, the data, first is the data, 
another is the software and third is the hardware hardware which includes the gps uh, we have a mobile apps uh, drones from which we can get the gps location of the particular area uh, data different kind of data whichever you required you can get it to analyze the your uh, interest of the species third is the types of data there are vector raster and topographic data in the first lecture we have gone through very detail but i will quick go through uh, this information vector data is the points line and polygons which we can use another is the raster data raster data is the pixel uh, pixel or image form of that grid which represent the area on the earth surface like topograph topo sheets and digital elevation models and the other satellite images uh, third is the topographic data topological data this de describe the spatial relationship between the geographic features allowing for the complex spatial analysis attribute data that attribute basically tells us the what are the other particular information is available but, uh, in that uh, uh, particular grids like road network vegetation inventories soil inventories census results municipal palities uh, municipal boundaries elevation values climate readings and habitat change so according what is our need we gather all these attribute data to incorpor incorporate with the our analysis to get the better inferences these are some formats which is widely used i mean well known one should know that safe files a popular vector data format for the geographic information system geotiff an open file format that can store geo referencing information along with the raster image and now the kml file a file format used to display the geographic data in the earth browser such as the uh google earth like this is the google earth we all are using that and so we can get the required information for the uh, in the kml format and we can easily visualize that information on the form in the google earth so whenever we visiting to the field so it will make us very easier to understand where we are going and where we are moving third is the gs data source what are the particular data source where we can get those gs data sets uh, from the satellite imagery that uh, provide the high resolution data for mapping and analysis in the morning we have already discussed about that like that uh, this now the uh, different forest type forest cover soil mapping everything is available on the set through our through the satellite imagery and isro and nasa has provided the good opportunity to get that data at the finer resolution at the 10 meter resolution even sometimes it goes very lower to the 1 1 km also 10 meter data also is available now drone survey from the drone survey we can get the uh, data we can map the entire um, landscape and get the information about the species and the ecosystem and whatever the uh, uh, required information we uh, needed from there then the sensor network uh, which is now the particularly people are using uh, uh, incorporating with the different system uh, like the uh, uh, tsunami and other cyclone and uh, track gps uh, live gps tracking system that can put and we can get through that the sensor database so uh, what are the uh, now uh, what are the important uh, part that we use for the uh, gis data analysis first gis data collection uh, whatever type of data you want um, then geo processing processing and visualization so include collection uh, uh, processing and managing the relevant data for the analysis Uh, geo processing what kind of boundaries we need to what rasters we need to put what district boundaries we have to select what additional kind of uh, data that we requires we all gather them and finally visualize the data on the map in the relevant information either you are performing the species distribution you are mapping the disease you are identifying the disease uh, sensitive zones and several other information you can get from this GIS applications already has been told, but there are a number of. But we will discuss about the environmental and conservation, where we you we are using it, habitat mapping and modeling, species distribution modeling, protected protected area management, corridor mapping, threatened map and risk assessment, community with com conservation, conservation planning and decision support, environmental impact assessment and conservation area and identification. So. 
how we are now including those data into the different aspects of the biological conservation. So, uh, like movement pattern, uh, someone has asked about that how it would be, it would be interesting if we include that uh, GIS data to uh, find out the location of elephant troops nearby the uh, uh, railway tracks. So, it is, it is possible that through the radio collaring, we have to uh, at least radio collared one or two animal within that troop and as it will come to that nearby uh, that uh, railway track, so it can be uh, that information can be sent to the respected department and they can take the action. Uh, early warning system that we are using and in the different aspects like conflict mitigation system and the uh, other aspects in but the only radio uh, this this limits that there these are the species subject to the schedule uh, uh, schedule one uh, protected under the wildlife protection act and such activities may not be provided and it may threaten those species which are highly uh, threatened due to the several aspects like poachers can get their live locations and they can easily caught fat uh, like the elephant and other species they are uh, i mean highly poached for their ivory so such practices only used for the management practices and it, this information this practice can be only performed inside the protected area where the protection is very high so through that movement pattern but we are uh, in using the GPS uh, radio collar on the species to understand the, uh, their migration pattern, how they are utilizing the habitats, where they are going. So accordingly, we can make some effective conservation planning to conserve these species. So uh, through GPS uh, uh, radio collars, we can uh, move and to understand their movement pattern, how they are using the different species. We have the application of that GIS in that respect also. Third, uh, second is the understanding gene flow and its, its implication in the population genetics. Like habitat have been threatened and fragmented. Uh, most of the species lost their habitat throughout the, their distribution range. So now including the biomolecules like the different genetic markers we are uh, extracting we are uh, analyzing those and then understanding what is the uh, level of gene flow between the two isolated lands how we can uh, connect those two fragmented patches to increase the movement pattern because what will happen if two fragmented landscape for example one or two species uh, one uh, meta population is there then the fragment if that is the habitat fragmented then the movement of that species will not occur between do those two patches and it will lead to ultimately inbreeding depression in that species and it will uh, you know uh, make them species to prone for the extinction third is the map of species diversity so how we can see the where is the species diversity is high where is the low accordingly the managers plan their conservation strategies and what a conservation efforts need to put in the different area this has this is the application now uh, in the biological sciences so we just gone through the what is the gis application in the biological conservation Second part, uh, we'll, we'll discuss how we monitor the biodiversity. What are the methods that we used? How the GIS is incorporated in there? There are four basic major methods from which we get the ecological data on the species. First is the sign survey, camera trapping, questionnaire survey, non-invasive genetics, and now advanced satellite tracking, acoustic survey, Acoustic survey means we need to put some acoustic devices in the, uh, eco uh, in, the, in the species habitat and we just record the voices of those species which are present. There are reference data available and we can just uh, uh, match those with the uh, available softwares and we can get the number of species which is highly non-invasive methods which do not disturb the species, which don't disturb the species in their ecosystem because uh, getting the now the, uh, in the enforcement of that uh, wildlife protection act restrict us to capture the animal and handle the animal so not most of the uh, we are now using the non-invasive method and what all methods i have described here these are all non-invasive where you need no need to handle the animal but you get most of the information about the species except satellite tracking or radio coloring when you are uh, making the radio collar the animal only that time you need to 
capture the animal. But again, this radio collaring, if you are going to radio collar animal, any animal, especially scheduled species, you need to go for multiple permission from the forest department, Ministry of Environment and Forest. Then they will allow you to capture the animal if the committee recommend that you can do the radio collaring if it is high priority in uh, for the conservation of that species. So we recommend highly the non-invasive methods where we don't handle, touch or disturb the animal, just we get the images or information about that species from the remotely. So, this is the outline how we design our study. Identification of habitat, for example, I want to study the tiger, yeah, I want to study the leopard and I want to understand how the leopard is distributed in this particular district and how it is performing with this habitat, what are the ecological rel uh, factors that is governing its distribution and where and what time this species is mostly active in that particular area. So what I will do first, I will identify the habitat based on the GIS mapping, gather the secondary information and remotely sense data which, which we have get the, from uh, that forest cover type, forest, uh, forest land use and land cover data is available. Then I will exclude the inaccessible area which is not accessible to survey the species, political sensitive areas and permafrost area in the high, I am in terms of the high altitude area, uh, this study, this is, I am talking about the Himachal Pradesh and there are many, most of the area where the uh, area is the permafrost means there are the glaciers, so that need, that area I don't need to survey, so I will exclude that area from the, my study and identifying the extensive and intensive study sites. So intensive Extensive study site, I will divide my grid, uh, I will divide my area into the some uh, sort of grids. This grid selection based on, this grid selection we will do based on the home range of that species. Means how long that species is migratory, how long that species can move in one day. Accordingly, I will fix my grids. It will be different. Then I will go for the one time sampling there, just recce the area and find out the where is I get the most of the sign for the species and in what type of habitat. Then I repeatedly do the intensive sampling and then finally confirm the status of that particular species in that area. This is the one uh, district which is in the Himachal Pradesh, uh, Shimla district and this is, we can see this is the forest type. Uh, uh, yeah. This is the forest type of different forest type uh, present in that landscape. I have excluded some of these grids where I don't need to sample. These are the five grids where I need to sample or this, for example, for, uh, this is for just example. I choose one four number of grids, five into five kilometer. I am sampling the leopard there. And in that five into five grids, I have to walk three grids or three trails of two to five kilometers or two to three kilometers based on the uh, 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 terrain complexity. And I will notice the different signs of that species in that particular area. For example, you can see there uh, in the first uh, uh, image, uh, herbivore pellets, pug marks, carnivore scats, direct sighting of the species. And one researcher in the, uh, my, my left side is, uh, uh, observing the uh, uh, signs of the species there. Before, uh, this is the landscape where you will go into the field, such kind of landscape you will occur where you first start your uh, trail. So these are two types of trails we can run across the contour and the along the contour or more uh, familiar way I can say the vertically or horizontally. These are the two trails and I, if I have to uh, uh, let's say I will uh, focus on this, I will uh, uh, go to the vertical, vertical to this habitat. But before starting the, my trail sampling, I have some basic component with me, so I can record data perfectly. One, I need uh, one survey sheet where I can get the uh, information about the what time I have started the trail, uh, what uh, GPS location we have to provide, what is the forest range, what is the forest beat uh, and so many inf information which uh, you can design according to your um, 
study design. Then uh, Ziploc bags, uh, brown bags, one pen, markers, one GPS. If you do not have the GPS, the mobile phones are assembled with the GPS locations and that you can use. Finally, now we are ready to move to the walk. This is the one trail, uh, example trail. I will start point. I will note it the GPS points where I have started. Suppose I walked one kilometer in the trail. Finally, I come across the one sign of the species. Any of signs you can come. This is the one sign of the aesthetic black bear in the Himachal Pradesh. I got it in this place. And finally, I record the data, GPS of this particular position, uh, altitude I will note, type of forest, which I uh, want to mention there. Uh, human disturbance is that area is humanly disturbed or not. Date and how far it is uh, from the, my far starting point, how far I, it, the distance I walked in that area, I will collect that information. And additional information you can also collect about the, uh, based on your study design and study interest and research question. Another one kilometer I have moved ahead, I also come across the one direct sighting of the species that is the blue ship found in the high altitude area of the Himachal Pradesh. I will again note down the uh, same information. Again, I walk 0.5 kilometer in, in same trail. I come across the another sign of the species. And during that uh, trail walk, I have to search my left side and uh, right side both about 5 to 10 meters, right? And this sign will come across and finally you will get the data on the species which whether it is present or not another is the camera trapping in same trail you will find some suitable place where you can put the install the camera trap so uh, uh, these camera trap basically be placed in the natural trails where the animal is moving or not if that uh, these trails uh, uh, we have to put uh, find out some uh, you know location where I can install the camera and we, I have to also ensure that camera is not installed because that camera is quite costly and uh, 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 so many factors I need to consider while installing. So basically from, uh, from the bottom, uh, 40, kilometers, uh, 40 centimeter of height it should be, so it, it, uh, it cover at least uh, 10 meters of uh, distance uh, whenever they move, uh, at that animal move from that in front of that camera it will get captures. You can see then right of my uh, there are one red fox and the sambar in the uh, sambar is you know walking in the snow and the, uh, that red fox is also in walking the snow. So at that time so how beautiful are these camera traps where you can get the activity of those animal in the wild if you are not present. So we just uh, uh, kept operated these camera traps for 30 days, 40 days, based on the uh, batteries we have on these camera. Now we have also some uh, solar panel camera, so these camera traps can be put in the uh, more than uh, two months, so they will get sun from that and uh, automatically they get charged. And again, wherever you cap put the camera traps, same uh, uh, ecological or the geo coordinates you have to collect. Uh, third is that once you move that uh, trail, you will come across different type of scats. You all need to collect those samples and need uh, uh, place those all in the jeep locks and brown bags, put all the uh, tagging properly, bring them in the uh, laboratory, analyze the samples for the species identification, population estimation, whatever the our research question is that. Uh, now, this is the part where the monitoring, uh, sorry, sample collection, study design ends and out how we have uh, get the, some output from those. This is one study we have conducted in the Lahul and Spiti, Himachal Pradesh for the brown bear species. Brown bear is the uh, wide ranging species uh, distributed throughout the, uh, throughout the world and possibly with the 16 subspecies based on their different habitats. Of them, one of the species, Himalayan brown bear, is distributed in the Himalayan, uh, Himalayan range of the central India, basically uh, uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. 
and uh, this is this species has a unique adaptability to survive in the high ecosystem spanning in the iran uh, it also found in the iran in india this species only found in the himachal pradesh high altitude range of the himachal pradesh uttarakhand and the uh, uh, ladakh and jammu and kashmir union territories so this is this species is schedule 1 in the wildlife protection act and the endangered got the endangered status in the iucn and Uh, very uh, little is known about this species we surveyed around 160 trails with 672 cam uh, kilometer of walk placed 111 camera traps with 3003 camera trap nights so this is the lahol spiti uh, this is the lahol valley map where we these are the camera trap location where we placed in the different habitat and finally we extracted the other ecological variables which influence the presence of that species in the particular area so this this study was particularly designed to identify it forest department told us to design the identify some conservation priority area for the himalayan brown bear in the lahol valley so we uh, got some top yeah we got uh, topographic uh, variables anthropogenic variables land as land cover and climatic variables how these variables are i mean uh, acting as a co uh, ecological covariates for the species present in that area we perform the species uh, occupancy modeling uh, this is a kind of regression with uh, multiple models we run around 33 models and identify that the two that you can see there are the red grids which are the uh, red in color are the highly suitable area means there is the uh, occupancy of this species from 0.51 to 1 means one occupancy means you went to that trail three times and you got the capture or sign of that species in the three times so mean uh, overall mean estimated occupancy was 0.01 to 1 and also range wise occupancy we have calculated that 0.56 to 0.75 and we found that occupancy of the brown bear is highly determined by the presence of the agriculture land and also by the human settlement negatively with the human settlement and the alpine postures right so this we have suggested these are the grids which can be prioritized for the conserving or impose some effective conservation management planning in the study this findings lead us to the address next very very important questions regarding the himalayan bear he which is we all know that throughout the india or global uh, issue is the human wildlife conflict so which are the species in the coexistence with the human are really very very i mean uh, uh, sometimes threaten the human life also just we recently seen that in the uttarakhand so many people have been attacked by the leopard in mid of the city of dehradun which is uh, in the rajpur road one of the uh, uh, populated area and leopards are quietly attacking in the himachal pradesh black bear are quite attacking to the people and in the lahol valley uh, that brown bear what that brown bear does that uh, depreded the people's agriculture and orchard, apple orchards so they have the huge losses from the conflict with the human uh, with the, this brown bear species so what we did we collected the primary data through the questionnaire survey we surveyed 390 uh, 98 families in the himachal uh, lahol valley uh, along with the we have also placed the around uh, 50 to 60 camera trap in their land uh, agriculture and uh, apple orchard and secondary data with the gps location we obtained from the forest department where they have provided the compensation schemes compensation to the families with uh, whose livestock was depleted by the himalayan brown bear and finally we identified some of the uh, uh, two uh, here uh, four number and the five number of cluster these are the patan and the tindi range of the lahol valley these are the two forest ranges where the brown bear conflict is more prominent rather than the one and three cluster so this is how we have suggested to the forest department and how we can utilize the gis technology in identifying the conflict hot spots so managers can you know uh, uh, make some uh, strategies to mitigate the conflict in that area 
Uh, third case studies species distribution model and delineating the species boundary of the species. This is the one musk deer. Um, you all must have heard about the name of the Kasturi Mirk, which is also known as the Kasturi Mirk. Ha it has a one uh, musk pod inside the male of the musk deer, which has been uh, globally killed to get that musk pod because that one gram of musk pod is cost around one, more than a lakh. So people use this musk pod uh, in the in the perfume industry and that is why this species is highly poached and 90% of the, the population of this Kashmir musk deer or the musk deer in throughout its distribution range have been declined due to majorly due to the poaching because the anthropogenic effect in this habitat because this species remains in very pristine and undisturbed habitat of the high altitude area above the 2500 meters of the altitude. So, uh, our question was to delineate the species boundary first. We can see there are total seven species of musk deer present, but we are more focused to understand the uh, distribution of two musk deer species in the Himalayan range. So, green and the uh, violet color is the uh, uh, distribution of the Kashmir musk deer and green color is shows that Himalayan musk deer. So, people claim that no, in the western Himalaya there are the uh, also presence of the Kashmir musk deer, also presence of the Himalayan musk deer and one another species that is the alpine musk deer, these three species are present in the Himalayan landscape. So our question, uh, we have studied in long back in 2017, we got some uh, uh, samples but that time we could not uh, finalize that uh, story but now we studied both uh, uh, we sampled the throughout the Himalaya, both Uttarkasi district and the Himachal uh, Uttarakhand and the Himachal Pradesh in the uh, Lahul Valley and some of the other reason we have collected the samples and we put both the DNA based technology, camera trapping, science survey, everything we have coupled with and uh, non-invasive samples we have collected around 100 and samples and finally come we come up across with the conclusion that only Kashmir musk deer present in the western Himalaya. So this is how the GI and now we are re uh, 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 created the redistribution of these species where the particular species is present. So Kashmir musk deer is present in the uh, in the western Himalaya. So this will make conservation effort weak because if the taxonomy of that particular species is not clear, so it is a very difficult to make the species centric conservation strategy for the particular species. Right, because this uh, musk deer is declining very rapidly, and their captive breeding program is going on. Uh, I uh, there are the in the Darjeeling do some of the musk deer were brought from the uh, Chamoli district of the Himachal Pradesh for the captive breeding program. Now that Western Himalaya, there is the Kashmir based musk deer, and the in the Darjeeling uh, area there is the Himalayan musk deer. So in breeding, uh, breeding between those two different species cannot be possible and therefore such a taxonomic delineation and the distribution or understanding of the distribution is very important for the part any kind of the species. So this is how we have used. Further, we model the distribution model, uh, model for the uh, Kashmir musk deer in the western Himalaya and from the total area which is available 3 lakh uh, 24,000 square kilometer of area is available there in the western Himalaya in which only 6.9% and 20,690 square kilometer is suitable for the Kashmir musk deer. Now we can imagine that how you know threatened and critically endangered is this population. And out of that only 4,726 square kilometer area of the Kashmir musk deer comes under the protected area region. So most of the distribution of this Kashmir, deer, uh, Kashmir musk deer is the out of the protected sites. So this is how we can suggest the, some effective conservation and management planning and how the GIS we can use in the bio biological conservation. Third study, fourth sorry, fourth study is that understanding the movement pattern and the genetic affinity of whale shark. This is the whale shark uh, is the largest fish and that attain the total length sometimes up to the 13 meters. Distributed in all tropical and the warm temperate sea except the Mediterranean. 
and this species also killed for the meat liver oils and the fins uh, uh, fins for, for the different purposes and that is why it is kept under the appendix 2 in the cites vulnerable in the iucn and uh, uh, schedule 1 in the wildlife protection act we perform uh, the uh, genetic study in the western coast of the himalaya uh, uh, west, uh, gujarat and the um, uh, east coast and we collected some samples and we also along with the wildlife trust of india we read uh, radio telemetry the some of the individuals and we found that the whale shark moved to the uh, west uh, arabian sea uh, I mean, they found the most affinity to the Africa rather than the uh, Africa, uh, Australian continent. So this is the wider prospect of the uh, GIS, radio telemetry and DNA-based uh, technologies to understand how the species is moving, how the species is, uh, have their affinity to the different level of uh, um, um, ecosystem, how they are uh, interacting with the different kind of uh, ecosystem. So whales are uh, very prominent and uh, you know uh, popular conservation efforts have been started in the west uh, in the Gujarat and same conservation strategy may not work in the different regions. So therefore the reason why is conservation strategy is required to make for the each species. Uh, this is the fifth species, Nilgiri thar, uh, distributed throughout the Western Ghat, one of the biodiversity hotspots, global biodiversity hotspot, and this species is critically endangered, uh, having very limited numbers around found in the uh, 16 total subpopulation throughout the Western Ghat. And this species is endemic to Western Ghat only. So we sampled the five block of the Western Ghat area. We used around 1300 uh, occurrence location, collected 928 fecal samples, amplified with the 13 microset loci and one mitochondrial DNA. And we found that yes, there are about five populations present in there and there are the geo, uh, uh, landscape barriers which hinders the movement pattern of those species, one of which the one major Palghat gap in the Western Ghat area, which has been highly human disturbed and now the people are cultivating the coffee and the teas in that valley and that is why that area is highly deterrent, I mean uh, bearing the uh, barrier for the species movement in that area. We also predicted the future climate of this species. You can see uh, the first map is showing that habitat is, uh, this is the present habitat. In the RCP2, in the next time, uh, in the next 50 years, uh, the 24 percent of the habitat of species will be lost. And in the RCP8.5, around 55.8 55.5% uh, of this habitat will be lost for this species. So accordingly, we need to adopt the special adaptive management planning for the particular species because rising of the temperature, vegetation will be shifted. And accordingly, we need to create a, some effective conservation planning to conserve this species. Finally, this was the study we conducted in the Himachal Pradesh to identify Himachal Pradesh government has uh, uh, requested Geological Survey of India to map the corridors and they want to connect the pro protected area to enhance the movement of the species between these corridors and we have uh, created the in the Kullu district we map uh, collected the various biological uh, information of the presence of the species and we uh, based on the genetics and the GI and the other ecological aspects we find some of the more uh, uh, suitable corridors for the species which is uh, uh, transect by the one river Bias river called and high altitude area is the Rotang pass all of you must have heard that this is the 4400 meters of height pass uh, which was earlier uh, earlier uh, um, vehicle movement was from there but now the formation of the atoll tunnel the movement of the some of the species 
may be increased in future and that is why this area is more you know conservation important so this this is the uh, what five or six study i have uh, 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 told here these are the some applications of the gis and the dna based technologies that we can use the conserve the species and monitoring of the biodiversity throughout the uh, in the different ecosystem with this thank you so much thank you dr joshi very wonderful lecture uh, lecture that describes the different aspects of wildlife and yes. biodiversity and so on so i think there will be from the audience please diva gis you can get srtm source you can get the uh, elevation model data diva gis you will get most of the data like uh, road network and uh, there are so many platforms available uh, so diva gis people are mu uh, mostly using to get the different uh, kind of the data from there hmm so for a very nice interactions very pertinent questions so thank you dr joshi in conclusion i would like to say that i believe that as a sequel to this seminar these different lectures there will be a renewed effort from the younger generations younger scientists to collaborate you know so a kind of culture of collaboration is necessary to incorporate artificial intelligence in the biological system so i request all stakeholders to think about it and the collaborative culture must be necessary for ourselves yeah, yeah sir Thank sure you. we are i mean uh, we are open to work any times and colleges also can send their uh, uh, students to us for the training we are just launching one another project in the himalaya so uh, you have opportunity we just few days back we have also advertised for the intern position so you will have the multiple chances to work on the environmental impact assessment where we are doing for the uh, road survey sir which the national uh, uh, nhi is making so that works come to the jdsi how that road is going to impact the biodiversity so accordingly we are performing those many so real times as well as the long term short term project we have the opportunity to work together and anyone can contact uh, either di director jdsi or individually us so if we have this some kind of opportunity we will definitely one month two months several you have the opportunity to work thank you very much thank you again dr joshi for um, saying these uh, wonderful giving all the students these wonderful uh, opportunities of experiencing in hand um, wildlife biology and it was a wonderful presentation thank you dr hom choudhury for your uh, sharing your words of wisdom i think uh, these are priceless words that resonates very well with us as well as the students so there are few other concluding um, uh, remarks about the uh, poster presentation which obishek is going to forward to all of you thank you again for your patience and enthusiasm thank you all for your patience i don't want to hold you any more for your lunch we have some
uh, use it as a label. When images are uploaded, it will pass through our model and finally it will tell, give a tag whether it is a left or a fake data. Sir, actually, we just a lot of work. We have a lot of work. We have a lot of work. We have a lot of work. And these are the references from where we have collected the Our professor, Deshki Moitin. So, apart from this academic uh, communication or academic placement and career counseling cell in this college. They take also number of initiatives to, uh, to offer various courses like that. Two programs are going on, cyber security and in short we will be going to launch one online program on artificial intelligence also. So you be with us, keep in touch with us, uh, you can mail us also. If you have any query regarding any other uh, program or any other online courses, certificate courses and so on. We give training also, we host because this kind of information sharing is a very good platform uh, to inform you. Um, we host, we conduct actually many programs for uh, uh, competitive exams like WBCS, like you know combined graduate level like banking, railway. So these online courses are there, programs are there. We conduct seminars, workshops also. So you keep in touch and you browse our the social media website, you will get the information. So this is a very short uh, you know, report or information what I wanted to share with you. So I think your what you all are waiting for uh, I will uh, declare, announce the result of this poster computation. Uh, I, I will request now our Obinjit Sen and others. Uh, is it ready? Oh, Madam is there. And before concluding, just one feedback I would like to know. Anything if you, if you have a form, so if anything you want to give us feedback, that also you can tell us. If you have something to say, something to share, I think after each talk, uh, this academic part, we had a question and session. So there you, you had the chance to interact with our speakers. So if you have anything feedback, that also you can let us know. Thank you. Now this is the time to know the result. Over to Sri Pornavi. Good afternoon, everyone. I shall announce the name of the winners. We have basically chosen five best poster presentations as the evaluations have been done. I shall declare the name of the poster or the number of the poster. So may I request all members of that particular team. We have certificates for each one of you here who have participated in that particular poster. But we have one memento and a set of books to be given to that group. So may I first declare the first winner, poster number 61. I shall announce the names as well. Aditi Basu, Audrija Sen, Orunima Gupta, 
Kimron Sena, Kaveri Dotto. The title of their presentation was Augmenting Human Health with Artificial Intelligence. Sir, College Hutsal, Department of Zoology, Shorajani Naidu College for Women. Our next team, which has won the best poster award, is poster number three. I shall declare the name of the students: Shomodip Dash, Rima Kundu, Srinjita Ghosh. The title of their presentation was "Navigating the Synthetic Landscape: Detecting AI Created Fakes in Images." Department of Computer Science, Ashutosh College. I am very happy to announce here, Prashenji, once before, you know, coming to this monastic life, so where now he is professor, Prashenji, so in a college I was teaching, in Howrah, where he was studying, North Shingadatta College. So I am very happy, that time he was studying in second year, so I, I was very happy to see one of my ex-students, now the faculty of Jepashampur Shri is a faculty, and now uh, taking this thing from my hand and also in the beginning I mentioned who is announcing I have my own privilege to take lesson of zoology especially genetics from her <laughs> Our next Intelligence and Geographic Information System in Sustainable Fish Growth. 
de partir dos olhos e acho que estou escolhendo. Thank you. 